Hello and welcome to And That's Why We Drink in the Arena. Was that helpful? No. I am Christine, and today I'm wearing my hat. Last week, Em was wearing their hat from our friend Lizzie, which yours says pantsless burrito, but also everybody commented like, who's going to tell Em that that actually means ass and like donkey in Spanish? Which I was like, that's a good point, because like burro means I mean, donkey. I... I know what it means, but do you so think you're I'm going to stop? you're a pantsless asshole. Okay, that actually fits a lot better. I literally am not wearing pants right now. Just so. Oh, yeah. I mean, I didn't think you were. If you and were, I, I'd be concerned. And I am a burro. So yeah. I'm not. Uh, who's shocked? You're a burrito. What about uh, your hat? So I'm wearing my hat, which is Surfer Rojo, which um, in remember when I, when I read it, I said, oh, it sounds like I'm on my period, like I'm surfing the red wave. And Lizzie <laughs> literally put a little clip art of someone surfing on a menstrual pad. I, like, and earlier, it's even I were on Zoom. Before hysterical you got, that you're calling it a clip art, by the way, because there's no way that was a clip art. Okay, so before you got on, even I were chatting and I was like, there's no way like Microsoft put this in their <clears throat> clip art edi- like expansion. So I don't know like how either she has and then i was like maybe it's a a hidden skill lizzie has of like creating really strange clip art which i I feel like that's a really important skill to to amplify it's one of those skills where like you don't know how powerful you are until someone desperately needs you (laughs) until until you have a really sudden use for the skill that you've been hiding yeah next time we need to like embroider hats with weird logos we're gonna have to hire her to be like a like a little designer or something which actually knowing us will probably happen sooner than we think Uh, i'm gonna have to use her for my escape rooms one day and be like i'm gonna need someone surfing a a maxi pad please thank you well i've got that already you can just borrow my (laughs) hat um so i'm very pleased about this i can just wear this to signal to everyone that i am uh on the rag as they say uh, yikes as offensive uh, people say well i I mean that is a a, probably a nice indicator for others just just so they know just like oh you need extra chocolate today step back yeah what it says to everybody And I'll listen, by the way. You will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, Em, hello. Why do you drink this week? A lot of people were like, oh, it was so nostalgic for you to say that last week. So I'm going to try to bring us back to our roots. Em, what do you drink and why do you drink? Today I drink water, which, like, by the way, they're not a sponsor of ours. But if you sure would like to be. No, no, sorry. But the cup that I'm drinking out of is a silly pint. I, like, fucking love them. So uh, it's like wiggly. Yeah, you have them. I I know you have them because I gave them to you for your bachelorette party. So oh, you, yes, uh-huh. I do have them. Ex- but that's they're right. Definitely yeah, not in my yeah, cabinet yeah. yet. Oops. Uh, no, they're the. If you don't know, silly S I L I. By the way, but they're um they're the silicone cups. So if you drop them, they don't break and all that. But um, they. Um, also I don't make... think you ever gave me those for my bachelorette party. Because huh. we had a solo cup. I'm like, I, I definitely would not have gotten rid of that if you They're, gave me They one. were the pink ones. They were the pink ones. They're, no, they were no, definitely your old cupboard. I have little plastic cupboard. ones that say, no, no, they mm. have plastic ones that say um, bridal, or something about bridal party and then I'm the bride, but they're plastic. They're not. Well, you went cheap, cheapo on me on that one. That, don't uh, buy yourself any silly pints then because I'm on my way with, with a purchase Yeah, I'm you. like, and I've never even held one of those. I don't. Oh. I think I would remember. Oh, no. Well, they also make wine glass ones. So like, it's, <gasps> so like if you drop them, they don't shower. It's literally just silicone. So it's all wiggly waggly. I but literally just went into a recess of my brain to look at the photos from that uh, bachelor party. I was like, solo cup, solo cup. Yeah, no, I don't think we had any of those. Okay, don't get yourself one then because it'll be a future present for me. But you can Yay! also get like your own designs on them. So this one's from Fredericksburg. Oh, that's very um, cute. But yeah, so anyway, they also have glow in the dark ones, which I have like three of them in of my course cupboard. You do. They really glow. You probably bought them for me and then kept them, is what I'm imagining happen. That could be it. Yeah. But anyway, I'm drinking water out of a silly pint. And um why do I drink? Well, because I texted you a few things last night in the in the middle of <laughs> Let me let me pretend like you didn't just say that because I've I want to actually preface. Um I didn't know if this was gonna be part of this segment, but uh, uh hang It on. could be. It could Everybody, be. Everybody, just stop listening and now listen again. <coughs> hey, hey, do you, I've been wondering, do you have an idea for a creepy coat? Creepy coat yeah. or creepy coat? Creepy coat? A creepy coat. You know, creepy coat. Um, I do yeah. know, definitely, what you that is. You do know. I texted Christy in the middle of the night and I was like, next time we're speaking, let me know all about, uh, ask 4 me about. 4.23 a.m. my time. <laughs> ask me on the show tomorrow about my idea for a capital C creepy, capital C coat. You and I what? said, okay. 
I th- also before that, I was going to say the reason why I drink is the other thing I texted you, which is I'm 100% sure that I'm in love with Tiana Okay, because that actually came in a weird time because I have a new love too that I'm like <gasps> actually really, 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 really sweating Uh-oh. over. So Is it Jude Law? Who? <laughs> yes. How did you know? Well, you tell yours first. I don't want to. I don't want to steal okay. your thunder. Okay. Well, if anyone's watching Wandavision, the second I laid eyes on Tiana Paris, I was like, "Uh oh, I'm in trouble." Especially the second when I, I laid eyes, I went, "Oh my god!" Who she, is oh, that? I sent I sent Christine a plethora of photos of Tiana Paris last night too. Wow, uh, she is unmatched. And also, the the wild part is, I started Wandavision ninety percent to stare at Lizzie Olsen the whole time, and now I've got two people to look at. Oh my goodness. Um, but no, Beautiful. I'm. At, I'm in love with her. If you don't know yet, she's uh, the new Captain Marvel, which is ironic because I just broke up with Brie Larson in my mind, and now I'm in love with the new Captain Marvel. So you just have um, a thing for the cape. Neither of them have capes. Oh. That's the craziest <laughs> I, part. Like, I just make up bullshit about superheroes. I actually kind of read that as like a like the trope of like, oh, the cape, a.k.a. You have a thing super- for the cape, wink, The wink. superheroes, the superheroes. Yeah. Well, you do. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so I guess out with the old and with the new. Sorry, Miss Bree, but Tiana Paris is my new love. Uh, this picture. She I can't think, be stopped. I think is we she, finally are just like smitten with one of the same people. And I don't she, even know who she is. She could punch me in the face and I'd say, thank you. Can I have some more? <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, who, who, who are you in love with? Okay, this is like, okay, I'm going to tell, tell me. you. Is it me? No. Oh my God, I yes! can't <laughs> Surprise! Oh. Blaze is packing up his belongings as we speak. I'll get my plane ticket ready. Finally, we can <laughs> we can announce it. Uh, no, Natalie Morales. Natalie Morales. I don't know that. Who is who she? God, I'm what's like, she on or in? So I only know her from. So she might recognize her. Do you oh, recognize? I kind of recognize her. She was in um, God, it's a Netflix show that I watched a while ago, and then I watched it again because I was like smitten with her, dude. I. She's- Girl. I'm usually attracted to men, but I was watching this and going like, I was. She's, she's got a Rosario Dawson vibe to her. Or like yes, a, yes. Or a, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, she's beautiful. It's been a long time since I've been like really, really actually uh, aggressively smitten with somebody. I was like looking at her Instagram like, oh my God, it's, prob- it's a problem. I had to like stop looking at her Instagram because I was like, this is really ridiculous. Like you're married. Um, and <laughs> it's really convenient that Blaze just started actually listening to the podcast for the first time in three years. So this is going to be a fun conversation. He sensed it. His spidey sense is really, what is going on? <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I already told him this because I couldn't stop talking about it. But man, I'm, I'm, I, it's... <sighs> I have a I have a man crush right now, which like it's a toxic one because like he's like personality wise, I don't know if I vibe with it. But we've been watching a lot of Below Deck, and there's a chef on there named Adam who's just a cutie pie. He's just a cutie, and uh, but so we've been watching a lot of Below Deck, and I out loud said like I get it. He's like so handsome and beautiful, and then I was like, why did I say that? But then I was like, you know what? This is the year of not giving a fuck about who you're yeah, attracted to. It's all a spectrum, man. It's I mean, all a listen. spectrum, which is ironic because Tiana Paris's version of Captain Mar- Marvel later becomes Spectrum. Ironic. Oh! Okay, it's all a spectrum. <laughs> it's all a spectrum. Uh, okay, let okay, me show anyway. you another picture. Please do. Oh, yeah, she's a cutie pie. Okay, I get it. That picture did it more for me than the other one. Oh, my God. It's really bad. So I need to so stop. Is she why you drink? Because you can't hold her at night? Is that why? <laughs> well, okay, so then Warner Brothers reached out on email and was like, oh, we're going to send you this fun box of stuff for an upcoming movie starring her. And I was like, ah! So I did a little unboxing video. And it has, um, I was about to say it has Jude Law. Oh, my God, Christine. <laughs> Uh, it has Denzel Washington and some other um, fun people, uh, Rami Malek. But yeah, so she's in it. So I've just, so I, like re-enter, she re-entered my brain is I uh-huh. guess what I'm saying yesterday. It's almost like it, now is the moment. The universe held off for a while, but now uh, I want you to re-love her. To talk about it on air, great. So anyway, that wasn't even why I drink. But when you, when you re- reminded me of the photos you sent me last night, I was like, oh yeah, uh, I'm also in love. So that's a problem. Um, anyway, well, I'm, I'm so happy, happy for you. Yeah, oh. good for us and our partners who are going to be pissed. Well, to answer your question about why I drink, uh, beyond Miss Paris s- slash future Miss Schultz, um, <laughs> uh, the creepy coat. So I have for a long time, I'll just say this real quick because I want to ask why you drink also, but um, I for a long time have been 
secretly in love with like patches like jacket oh patches. yeah love patches and i've just never had like i don't i still don't have like a a, a jacket coat. that's like worthy of like yeah. patching up and stuff and i was always like i don't know like maybe i'm like too old for that now or like maybe that's not like my vibe or maybe i would look weird wearing that but i've just got I've says the person with- wearing literal fucking fish on their feet says oh that might be too weird for me i have to, it might be too weird for me because at least people expect fish on my feet people don't expect me to like do something that like they'd could be like potentially... are you having a quarter life crisis or something yeah yeah it might look like i'm like like with fish flops there's guaranteed zero real style behind it but like with a jacket with patches it's like oh are you trying it's to like look are you cool? trying right I yeah get you. and i, I don't and i'm kind of scared of that but I've just seen too many patches I like now, and they all happen to be, like, paranormal-themed. Yes. And so I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to, when I find the right coat, that will be the universe telling me it's my moment. And I'm just going to get all the fucking patches, and I'm going to call it my creepy coat. And that's, and. Yes. So now I'm I'm drinking because I'm, I'm excited. I'm manifesting this creepy coat coming my way, so. Oh my gosh. Wait, that's so exciting. I have a bunch of patches, too, and I've, I have denim jackets, but I've never, like, committed to which jacket right. to put them on so i have a big pile of them i have and i have a mothman i have a bigfoot um they're all like paranormal for some yeah. reason so we could have both have creepy coats also my big thing is like i have such a struggle with like if i find the right coat it's like oh i already found the right coat without patches on it and i like how it looks right. like now am I, am I gonna ruin it by putting patches all over it so then i like get in my own head of like like should i damage something that already looks great or potentially damage it or do i find something kind of gross and amp it up like i don't know how it's, it's gonna like go. i feel like it's a reflection because i'm the same way and i feel like it's a reflection of me with stickers when i was little because i was just so scared to like put them on like yeah. i was obsessed with stickers but then i was like well i don't want to commit to putting them on something and then never mm-hmm. and so then i just had a fucking box of stickers that's like okay now i just have these stickers that i never got to use and you know put well, on because things. there's always like that one popular girl who fucking knew interior design by eight and like knew how to like put the stickers on the journal so it all looked beautiful but then when i would put stickers on it would just look like a fucking mess and they would get like hair stuck to them and i was like now i'm that girl again who i'm and- always that weird german girl covered in hair <laughs> well that's my big fear when it comes to like like i have the sticker phobia with patches i'm like what if i don't know how to place these like yep. and i totally and then you're fuck committing it up. and gemini's don't like that feeling of committing uh-uh and uh-uh. i also not only do i fuck up the jacket i fuck up the patches like i have that's to a, rebuy the them the worst and part. the jacket I and need to so like special. I need to collect a bunch and then give them to someone who knows what they're fucking doing and just say like give it to me when it's done. Okay. Creepy coat status. Creepy coat anyway. What are In you process. drinking and why do you drink? Well, I mean, I'm drinking water also um, out of my favorite cup, which like Blaze always makes fun of me, but it's this random cup. Um, Your car cup? Yes, my car cup. Ugh. How do you know about my car cup? Because you don't it. shut up about it, Christine. <laughs> Blaze always makes fun of me. So I had this cup. I bought my car from Carvana, which is just like a website where you don't have to talk to humans to buy a car. So that's where I bought my car like a few years ago. Um, very much a used car, but but I was very excited and proud. It was my first car I ever bought. And with the car, I love free shit. With the car, they gave me this, like, water cup or this, like, tumbler. I don't know what it's called. Plastic tumbler. And it just says Carvana. Um, And I just developed, like, this weird – like, I would only drink water out of it. And if I was using this cup, I would drink, like, all the water. And I'm very bad at drinking – like, I used to go days without ever drinking water or, like, weeks without drinking water. Um, And so, finally, I had this cup. And then one day I dropped it in the driveway and it, like, splintered into a million pieces. And I was – devastated and blaze was like look here on amazon it's the exact same cup and i was like no it isn't that's not a carvana cup and so i went on the carvana like customer service site and said like where can i buy a cup and they were like here's an actual link to buy the cup because i guess you can just instead of buying a car just buy a cup with the brand on it i like how they were someone at customer service that day was like holy shit this person wants a fucking this is the first person to ever ask us for yeah like like tech tech office put up a link to buy this cup i guess because one person wants it and so I ordered it and uh, it's like my prized possession I'm a huge weirdo but I love my cup my car cup um leave it to Christine to get weirdly attached to something that makes no sense and (laughs) also like the only reason I know about it is because I was with you like the day after it shattered and you were like in a deep depression about it and I was like what is your fucking deal and I looked like Spongebob when he was out of the water because I was like (laughs) and you were like what's wrong and Blaze was like Christine won't drink water out of any I'm like a child like she needs her sippy cup or else she won't drink her water the Carvana cup is your fishbowl and Sandy (laughs) Cheeks is 
planetarium or terrarium or whatever it is. Yes, it is. And anyway, so I'm drinking water out of my cup. Thank you for asking. And I'm drinking water. We're both so boring this week, but I'm drinking water because I'm in a place with winter for the first time in like six years or five years. I don't know. Are you how feeling long. dry? Yes. And I'm like crusty. Sorry. Mm. That's gross. But my skin is always very dry because I a have dry skin and B never drink water. And so I'm trying to force myself to actually drink water because like wine definitely does the opposite for your mm. water intake. Um, I can so. gather that. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm in a winter spot. It's very cold. Five thirty in the morning, Gio has to go pee. It is like seventeen degrees out, and uh, it's not a fun time. But um, it's kind of cool for a minute. I'm sure by next month they'll be like, "Get me out of here." Well, for now it's cute when it snows. I'm like, "Aw." We're enjoying our winter right now, but I have this like weird LA winter where it's like it hits forty or fifty at night for mm-hmm. five minutes, and then it goes back to like the sixties or seventies. But like, um. I have this weird issue where after so many years of living in LA, once it gets cold, I know that our winter is so short and not only is it so short, but it instantly goes to fucking blazing hot. That like, even though I'm trying to appreciate it, I have like this weird, uh, like paranoia of like, Oh my God, is tomorrow the day it's fucking hot is tomorrow the day it's fucking hot. (laughs) So I can't, so I can't just relax and And enjoy the, yeah. Our very first, uh, when we first moved to LA and we were here through the Boston University program, we had like an orientation where basically one of the professors taught us about LA. And one of the only takeaways I have from that is when they said, once it hits February, that's the rainy season where it rains once and people freak out and then it gets cold. And then like a month later, it's the hottest it'll ever be all over again for another 11 months. And <laughs> Yeah, truly. It's like a place of and extremes, I, yes. I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds terrible. But there's no way that they mean that. There's no way. There's no way. And then the first time we were there, we were here in January, February. By like March 1st, it feels like you're in hell again. And so I was like, fuck. So now every time it, it gets cold, I'm just waiting for the day that you I'm miserable. You can't enjoy sweater weather. Yes. Sweater and weather. I, sweater weather. And I do like uh, my layers and my comfy clothes. So I am enjoying that, especially because I don't need to leave the house. So I don't need to look presentable. So I just wear fuzzy clothes all the time. Um, so I guess I'm drinking for cold, but that's all. It's not very interesting. So sorry, I talked about it for 10 minutes. Um, anyway, I'm drinking, I'm drinking with you, though, and that like, I wish I got to experience the cold for longer than five seconds. So. It's like, I'm not I don't hate it yet. I think I'll hate it when it's so gloomy that like, I think I hated it more when I worked outside of home and had to drive into work at like 6am every day, mm. back in the day, or go to school that I did not like. When I'm at home, it's easier because you don't have to like leave the house, you can just stay cozy. That's true. Um, so I don't know. Listen, I, I will always find a reason to complain, as you all know. So here we are, complaining. Welcome. Welcome. We've ha- we have a show literally called And That's Why We Drink. So like, <laughs> And why? Think- Don't ask, because you're going to get an ans- a lot of answers. <laughs> <laughs> More answers than you wanted. Zola makes wedding planning easier and less stressful. And I remember you talking about it nonstop because it creates everything <laughs> all couples need all in one place between wedding vendors, save the dates, invitations, free websites, registry, all of that. You were screaming about it. I had to hear about it. And now everyone else gets to hear about it. That's right. I actually, I kind of miss being engaged because Zola made it so much fun to do my wedding registry. That's where I got my beautiful vacuum. Um, they have amazing <laughs> brands, <laughs> uh, but you can also find pre-screened vendors. So you don't have to like do a back and forth with vendors that might not work well for you. Um, and they have personalized recommendations depending on your style, budget, and more even save the dates and invitations, which is brilliant. So it's basically all in one place, even a free wedding website. I mean, everything you would need, uh, they make it so easy. You can do frequently asked questions, an online RSVP page, like everything that's kind of out there for planning your wedding, but all in one place, which is amazing. Go to Zola.com slash drink today and use promo code save 50. That's save five zero to get 50% off your save the dates. You can also get free personalized paper samples before you purchase That's Zola.com slash drink promo code save 50. So um, I've been trying to cook more at home and I'm actually pretty bummed out because it's only Wednesday and I'm out of HelloFresh meals for the week. (laughs) I've cooked all three of them and now I'm like, well, now what do I do? I wish I could like quickly order another one uh, same day because yesterday I made the roasted garlic and zucchini flatbreads and I was like, I wish I could just order three more of those and then make them. I was going to say, I wish that I could just 
request one that I already ate this week and just have it come back over to my and door. over again. <laughs> I had the beef, I had the beef bulgogi bowl, which is like oh. these really nice meatballs with rice and everything. It was so, so good. And now I have to wait for my next HelloFresh order to come. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in about 30 minutes or less. You can also cut down on grocery bills, which is what I've been trying to do, and food waste, which is also awesome because HelloFresh delivers pre-portioned ingredients so you're not overbuying, which is a burden on the planet and your wallet. Go to HelloFresh.com slash drink10 and use code drink10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash drink10 and use code drink10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. Uh, so my story this, uh, this week, by the way, uh, I hope you're excited because it's a, it's a, a UFO tale. I'm always excited. And now I'm even more excited. I was going to say I'm excited, but then you said UFO and my pitch just like automatically increased. <laughs> I'm went, very excited. You went up an octave. I love ah! it. Um, um, wait, okay. Sorry. Before we do this, I know there was one thing we had to mention, which is that we were on Let's Not Meet. We did, we shared stories oh, yes. on Let's Not Meet and we never mentioned it. And um, I was just, I wanted to throw that out there as part of the intro before. No, we, we were definitely but. part of Let's Not Meet. And uh, Andrew was very kind to us and had us on. Actually, the, the reason we even got on was because there was an exchange on Twitter. Again, um, yeah. Which uh, is just proof that, like, if you want it, ask for it and well, see what happens. Well, it's funny because somebody wrote, I want you guys to be on Let's Not Meet. And then literally two hours later, it was like, just kidding. I just found the episode where Christine is on Let's Not Meet. But then we were like, well, we'll do it again. <laughs> like, we don't yeah, mind. someone said, or someone said something like, oh, now that Christine's been on there, uh, we should get M. And then within seconds, I was like, okay. And then Andrew DM'd us. So, I mean, it yeah. worked out really well. So. Technology makes it easy nowadays to do these fun crossovers. So, anyway, thank you, Andrew. That was a blast. Um, and it was also the week that My Favorite Murder mentioned Let's Not Me on their podcast, which obviously was huge. So, I was like, shit, man, he's blowing up. So, check them out um it's a great show so our my story today is a ufo story and it is the japan airlines flight 1628 so this is in 1986 this took place november 17th and basically there was this uh, japanese boeing 747 and it was a cargo aircraft that was en route from paris to narita international airport um it was near tokyo and uh it was the cargo it was carrying was a bunch of wine Oh, um, oh god <laughs> oh my god and, you didn't also, prepare me for that and also a stowaway named christine <laughs> I um, was, that's all the wine disappeared and they think it was a ufo christine who was negative five all of a sudden <laughs> was hammered that was um, good math though thank you I, look i'm really good with the negatives so <laughs> Um, yeah, so it was, uh, the wine specifically was called Beaujolais. It's from France. Beaujolais, yeah, that's one of Beaujolais. my favorites. Celine and I always drink that when we can save up the money because it's like 15 or 20 bucks. So it's pricey. In my, oh, shit. In my world, it's pricey because I drink a whole bottle of it at once. But it's like, yeah, 20 bucks. <laughs> but it's good. Well, there you go. So it was literally carrying Beaujolais? Beaujolais, Beaujolais yeah. It's, okay. uh, that's at least how Celine and I say it. I don't know if that's actually correct. but I like how it sounds a little bougie. It uh, uh, yeah, does. It's almost like uh, it feels like you're – I drank it in Florida, too, so it was very um, non-bougie experience drinking <laughs> it, uh, buying it at, like, a mini mart. But it's it's good. It's good stuff. Well, fun fact, Japan is the number one export for Beaujolais. And actually in 2019 – uh, I think around 5 million bottles were exported uh, from Ooh. Japan. So Damn. that's about 50% of the total exported volume. Too. Holy so, shit. They're into that Beaujolais French wine, I guess. J that's Japan crazy. is into it. So uh, this is an excerpt, by the way. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I want to. I, I'm going to say it. I didn't want to give anything away. So I just wanted to double check. But in 1995, so years, years later, there was an excerpt by a MUFON member um, named Jay Harper. He wrote an article called Alaska UFO Mothership Revisited. And uh, this is an excerpt from it saying, uh, the captain boarded the plane before dawn in Iceland with two other members of the flight crew. So there was a co-pilot and a flight engineer. And uh, the takeoff weight from Iceland was at its max. So there was nothing else that the that the plane could carry. Um, I think it was like over, like almost 800,000 pounds or something. Oh, boy. Um, and they have they're in the air for about four hours. And that's where the story kind of takes place. So on the flight's leg, 
uh, to Anchorage at 5.11 at night over eastern Alaska, the crew sees two UFOs on their left. <gasps> um, all three members see the UFOs following them. So the co-pilot, the flight engineer, and Captain Tarachi. Tarachi? Tarachi? Um, <clears throat> who, by the way, he's like an ex- fighter pilot with like thousands and thousands of hours of flight experience so if he says he's seeing a ufo i'm kind of inclined to believe him yeah it's not his first time in the skies he's not like what's that strange yeah it's not as not as not his first rodeo that makes it more uh somehow believable in a way this is uh, a quote uh from captain tarachi of the experience They were flying parallel and then suddenly approached very close. The things were flying as if there was no thing as, as as if there was no such thing as gravity. Uh, It sped up, then stopped, then flew at our speed in our direction so that to us, it appeared to be standing still. So it was just staying perfectly. Oh, that's creepy. Like a helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. The next instant it changed course. In other words, the flying object had overcome gravity. So it's just defying physics left and right. Ah! Keeping in tune with them. Gra- okay, I'm not going to try that. It's not, it's not pretty. It's not pretty. <laughs> oh, Alphaba. Uh, no. So it, a year, or not even a year later, only two months later after the incident happened in November 86, January 87, the New York Times was writing about it. And Tarauchi said that two of the lights were very small. Um, I guess, to me, it sounds big. But I guess if you're a captain in an airplane, this is small. Uh, that... The two of the lights were really small. They were no larger than eight feet wide. But the third light appeared to be on an aircraft and really big. Um, Okay. Yeah, eight feet does sound big, but I guess, yeah, you're right. Maybe not. It sounds big when I'm thinking of, like, standing next to it, but not looking out a window. (laughs) When it's taller than you. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So he said that the lights that he saw were yellow, amber, and green, but they were not red, which is the international color for... Okay. Was that on your end? That was my end. Okay, because Blaze literally just texted me, I'm going to hit my punching bag. Can you tell me if you hear it? And literally at that second, that noise happened. And I was like, what kind of fucking punching bag did he get? Tell tell Blaze I heard it. Uh (laughs) (laughs) All the way in Burbank, actually. So he also said that the lights that he saw were yellow, amber, and green, but they were not red because, uh, not because, but he would have remembered if they were red because red is the international color for an aircraft beacon. And so... He would have noticed if it was red, but he remembers it being yellow, amber, and green. Okay. The co-pilot named Takanori Tamafuji, very good name, uh, compared the lights to uh, like Christmas lights, but with a salmon color, which Ew. is interesting. <laughs> yeah, you know, that sounds like Florida, like salmon yeah. color <laughs> Christmas lights. Yeah. Flamingo lights. Um, <laughs> and he said, I remember red or orange and white landing light and weak green blinking. Apparently, the co-pilot also said that he remembers the lights fading, kind of like, um, you know how if you have, these days, lights have different settings, and you can do, like, the pulsing, the slow Mm -hmm. pulse. He remembers lights doing that. He says that they remember, he remembers them becoming stronger, and then weaker, and then stronger, and then weaker, which is different from strobe lights, which move really fast. Sure, okay. That was how he remembers it, of, like, they weren't strobe lights, they were really, like, undulating, is the word he used. Undulating. Yeah. Uh, The lights were moving in unison as if they were two aircrafts with, quote, very good formation. So, like, super synchronized, which is Uh just the worst. Just the... It's somehow... I don't know why, but that makes it so much creepier. (laughs) Anything where two items are able to synchronize freaks me out. Because I'm like, you shouldn't be that in tune. What about our friendship lamps that I bought us? precious, but also creepy to, like, imagine... Very creepy. Imagine if you're from the 1100s and that happened. That'd be creepy, you know? Well, I think a lot of things would be... Cre- I think my my surfing on a menstrual pad would be creepy if you were from the 1100s. This podcast, they'd be like, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> We'd be already on a, on a stake somewhere. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but I'm going to switch your... I figured out you could change the color coding of these friendship lamps. So I'm going to turn to your salmon tonight and see what happens if you oh, I love call, the, call MUFON your MUFON friends. Have you been Have you been uh, seeing me change it a lot or no? No, because I it said you need to update it. By the way, all you all, I just logged into our like friendship lip. I finally set it up and it was like, Linda is part of your family. And I went, Linda? And Em was like, yeah, I bought her a friendship lamp and synced it to mine. So now she's in our like family, our group chat via friendship lamp, which is hysterical. I so apparently you can get different lights that all sync up to like different things. So you can have different relationships with different lamps. But 
I found out that because when you got us friendship lamps, you got them as a set, and so they have a different factory setting. Yeah, that's my favorite thing is that I bought us a set, and then Emma was like, here, Mom, you can have your own. <laughs> well, I didn't know that there was a factory setting where, like, ours were the only ones linked to each other. So I thought, like, oh, you got me one. That's a great idea. I'll save that for my mom. And so for Christmas, I got her a lamp, thinking that her and I could have our own lamp relationship. You and I could have our own lamp yeah, I'm relationship. Yeah, trying to share our relationship with other people. It's fine. Apparently, it's like a group chat. And so now anytime that Christine or I do mean something for each other, my mom's going to see her light glow. Which so. is actually how it should be. She Every time we think of each other, <laughs> she's like, yep, I'm important. And so I think she, that's actually I, pretty spot on. I'm inserting myself into the narrative. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so sorry Remember about that. Time that. she wanted to fly to LA to like just be get a guest on the podcast, and we were like two weeks in, and you were like, "Wait, what?" This woman really—I gotta give her credit uh, in terms of confidence. Uh, <laughs> also, like, tell me, this is not the bougiest thing you've ever heard in your life. Oh, God. She. Think of for those of you who are new, welcome. But my mother is like kind of a combination of like Chris Jenner and Moira Rose. Yeah, and you'll so, be, oh, that's a great. Oh, and uh, Lucille Bluth. It's a and great Lucille Bluth trio. It's, yeah, it's like if all three of them just had like <laughs> the An most alien child, the most interesting characteristics all put together. But um, so I'm not even 29 yet, and my mother's already planning my 30th birthday. And uh, because we made a deal a long time ago, she would plan my 30th and I would plan her 60th. And they happen to happen in the same year, which happens to be 2022, which is our lucky number. So it's like a big deal to only us. But she literally has been texting me. It's so interesting that like I must have just changed a lot since the last time I lived under her roof and she knew everything about me because the things that she's sending me are like things that are just like not my cup of tea Ooh, like, like what like Christine she literally said like so I'm looking at this one company and you can rent a tiger do you want a tiger at your <gasps> birthday party <laughs> What? Is that what you were into? Like, what do you mean? No, but I think I used to, like, because I lived under her roof, I just, like, didn't know any better. And, like, I just thought that was a normal ask. And, like, now I'm just, like... Sorry, that was a normal ask under your roof? Can I rent a tiger? <laughs> I think what is just, going on? Am I, I think like, I was, losing it? I think I was just used to, like, like... Like, you know how you leave your home when you get older and then you're like, oh, that wasn't normal. I think I. Yeah. I mean, I thought I knew that, but I guess I don't actually know it because you seem to know it on a different level. I think I think my mom was just always like, I mean, I never got anything like a fucking tiger for a birthday. But I think like her, I think it's, we kind of have that same personality trait of like, look at the most fucking ridiculous things uh-huh. possible yeah. and like, and then narrow it down once you figure out like where their interests lie. And so I think she was really starting fucking broad with like, do you want a tiger? Okay. I love and that the- you were like, my mom never actually gave me a tiger. And I'm like, she's literally offering to get you a tiger right now. I know. You but before that. people think uh, it was like super silver spoons and like, I just am used to zoos at my house. I just like, I'm used to her asking really wild, okay, lavish things. Okay, I have a things. question. This is my level of like, of like sil- bougie whateverness. Did yeah. you ever get a bouncy castle rented for you? No, but I do think I was. Uh, I think if I asked, maybe it would have been on the table. But I, you know what's really fucking bougie? Um, and to be fair, like we have grown out of this lifestyle. <laughs> I'm not this type of person. But I remember like my mom really wanted to throw me like a huge birthday party when I was a little kid. I remember her saying something about like wanting to like have a clown at a birthday party. Oh, and then like, um, I feel like she like made a joke about pony rides. I don't remember. but You I, had I'm, ponies? I'm kind of scared there might have been a pony ride situation. Because <gasps> that I was my re- next question. I was like, ponies are above bouncy house in my book. I f- certainly never got well, a pony the, or the a sad, bouncy house. The sad thing is I don't even remember it. I was so young. Like, I like I, I don't think memory you were had started building. I mean, I probably. I I was probably like, yo, this isn't a fucking tiger. I don't even want it. So uh, Yeah, where's my tiger? Um, <laughs> but, so, but no, wow. so, my, so my mom was asking, like, all these wild questions where, like, I literally, I... I want a superhero party like I had last year or like I want to like go to an escape room like, party <laughs> a slumber party I literally had a all I wanted for my 20th birthday was to have a sleepover with my friends on seven dollar Walmart mattresses that's what I wanted and my mother's out here like do you want a tiger and I'm like I respect the fact that you're really trying to gauge my interest like to the fullest extent 
but like we can we can really rein it but in i can here. see the like, connection though i feel like you're very extra like i feel like you would do that for your child someday like you would i mean not a tiger because we all know now that's very inhumane but i think oh yeah uh, i think uh <clears throat> you would definitely like go all out and rent like the amityville house or some shit i feel like you would for sure do that well but, so i think the reason the tiger thing happened because like yes my mother is very bougie and i by the way like want to like take the moment to say like i'm very aware of the privilege that's there and that like i'm very lucky that i grew up with a mom who could provide me with truly tigers. whatever i wanted tigers if i fucking wanted them I think my mom's also very lucky that she got a kid who doesn't want any of that shit. I was <laughs> like, going to say, actually, that's an interesting combo. Yeah. But uh, but at the same time, I, I do think I have to give her credit in that, like, that's how my wanting to give people really wild presents yeah, came Yeah, no, about. I see the connection. Yeah. And the only, the reason that she, I think she brought the tigers is because for my 28th birthday, when I was saying that I won my superhero party, I told her, by the way, did you know there's a company out there where like you can like rent puppies? Oh and, yes, like, I remember this. And you can like, apparently there's like a handler comes with you and like, it's basically for your birthday, you get like five hours of like, a basket of, them. a basket of puppies and someone comes with them to like clean up the pee and poo and all that but basically you get to cuddle puppies and then they go somewhere else afterwards and yeah. i was like that sounds like a fantastic business plan like why haven't we mm-hmm. just like really as a generation looked into that more <laughs> like oh nickelodeon you, used to have puppy days and they would bring puppies to like we colleges have like, have, have like colleges yeah. during exam week have puppy days exactly and also, i think our generation hardcore leaned into puppy days I think the company also had like uh, they would bring paperwork. So, like if you fell in love with one and you, you wanted can to adopt like, them, yeah, adopt or foster. I think it's a great thing. And so my mom heard like animal rentals and then really went over the fucking top. But so uh, I, I was like, yo, I just wanted like a little golden retriever puppy to just like sit on me for a couple hours. That was it. <laughs> but so wow. anyway, I'm probably giving people a, a really bad look at like my uh, my no, upbringing. No, we both but, have weird upbringing. I mean. We had weird upbringings in different ways, so I think people are used to it. And we all know, know Linda. We're not surprised by Linda's behavior at this point. I'm telling you, Moira Rose, Chris Jenner, Lucille Bluth, they're just like, oh, you want a tiger? Okay. But, like, again, also, like, thank God that's not my cup of tea. I just wanted a fucking puppy, and if it wasn't available, I understood. It was probably with, like, a much smarter college student who needed it. Smarter <laughs> college student? <laughs> During exam week. <laughs> Uh, but no, so anyway, I don't know how we got on that topic. I don't of- either. I think um, I think you said, do you want to know something bougie? Hmm. So, I oh, guess cause so. Oh, because we, we were talking about the lamps. What lamps? Who? Oh, the friendship the- lamps. Because <laughs> I said Linda showed up and she inserted herself. Remember when she wanted to fly to LA to be on the show? Yes, that was, I mean, that was like just a very small. So I said I was going to turn your friendship lamp into salmon color so you could call MUFON. That's it was all. a very, it was a very small uh, taste that she wanted to insert herself Listen, into our podcast. Listen, last week everyone got a bear, a bear update. This week they get a Linda update. That's just how it goes here. Bears and tigers. So now we all, all lions we is... and tigers and bears. Oh my! Next Linda's, week, Eve... hold on. Lindas and tigers and bears. Now they Linda's... bear and Linda would put on a bonanza. My mother, when I was like, "Do I get a bridal shower?" She's like do you expect me to pay for something like that? So like, <laughs> that is not how uh, my mother behaves. But my father would definitely be on board with like a pretty uh, bonkers situation. He would probably make it a little bit off. Like everything would be like off brand or like something from Germany. That's like, instead of an iPhone when I, or an iPod when I was little, he got me an iRiver. Um, so like instead think- of, instead of Kirkland blueberries, you well instead of like just real like fresh blueberries you got kirkland dry yes exactly yeah so i think i think linda would need to like be the head honcho and like monitor well uh just for those listening if you are interested in all of the wild adventures of linda be prepared for the next year and a half because my 30th birthday is not even around the corner and I have to deal with requests like that coming in and rejecting them oh, at I'm so full amped. stops. I'm going to text her separately be like, hit me up because I am ready to plan this for him. Christine my- will be like 10 tigers. No, them- <laughs> I watch Tiger King, man. I'm, I don't even eat meat. Um, but yeah, no, my mom texted me the other day said, did you know you're turning 30 this year? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, that's old. And I was like, screw you, lady. So don't worry. My experience is worse than yours. Uh, well, I don't get any party. I'll give you uh, updates about the weird things my mom requests. Thank and you. So that's where we'll that's where we'll end up. And also, you will be involved at some point, so just be ready. Yes. Oh my gosh! Good luck editing that. Sorry, down to everybody. 
well sorry to you what we do sorry to you editing it no it's fine we'll leave it in (laughs) too late uh oh yeah lights and ufos do you remember that yes i do so the lights were moving in unison as if oh because we were talking about synchronized and the lamps Mm -hmm. yeah 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 yeah, creepy 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 coat uh he okay so the captain also compared the clarity of the lights to seeing head-on traffic but he couldn't see the total shape so he was like this wasn't something i like blinked and it went away like this was something that was in my fucking face uh he said that he even dimmed his own lights in the cockpit to make sure that he wasn't seeing a reflection from something else um but the objects followed him for 400 miles oh dear uh, he said that he tried to get a picture of the lights and this, by the way, speaking of our parents, sounds like them trying to take a picture. Um, this is a quote from him. I thought perhaps it was one of those things called a UFO and taking a photo might help to identify the object later. The area in which the plane was flying was unchanged, but the lights were still moving strangely. The lens kept adjusting and could never get a real focus. I changed autofocus to manual focus and pressed the shutter, but this time the shutter would not close. Then our aircraft began to vibrate and I gave up. Oh, he's like, uh, there are priorities here. The plane is vibrating. Oh, God. Uh, so six minutes later, the captain reported this to uh, FAA air controllers in Anchorage, and the controllers uh, could only see the captain's plane. They were like, we don't know what it is that's next to you. We can't oh. see it. And so uh, the UFO soon after, though, appeared on the FAA Air Force and cockpit radars, radars sorry, and... Um, but it only showed up for a short while. But they were able to see it just show up. Do on. you wonder if if the if the UFOs like heard like oh we can't see anything and then they were like here we are and then they that's like, the disappeared? that's the Christine mind thinking there of like they're always listening. They're yes, always that's listening. my mind. That's my very paranoid brain of like do you think they are playing with all of us? Um, but that's what I don't it sounds know. Like it does sound like it was like oh you want to see us? Okay. Here we are. It seems like they have control over whether they're able to be spotted on radar or not, which is why would they turn it on? That's an interesting note, but hold on to that because okay, okay. that's, that's I'm holding on tight. So uh, the captain also told the UFO, uh, told uh, FAA that the UFO was staying with him and the controllers uh, told him to take action if necessary, which I don't know what you're going to do with a plane full of wine and just like take action. <laughs> and it's vibrating. You're like, this is going right. to be real messy. <laughs> um, so uh, Captain Sorochi... He decreased the plane's altitude by 31,000 feet, uh, but the lights followed him perfectly all the way down. <gasps> That's not good for me. I'm not into that. Captain Sirachi then heard random VHF or very high frequency radio static, and he had never heard that before in his entire airline <sighs> career. Um, he described them. This was his quote of how it, the static sounded. He said, it's some kind of jamming. It was just a weird noise, like, za, za. And I was like, okay, bear. <laughs> okay, bear. I almost said, okay, dad. <laughs> that sounds like my eye river malfunctioning the first day I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't take a picture with it, and it sounded like za, za. <laughs> <laughs> it's not supposed to, It's not a camera, dad. <laughs> Uh, he then turned the, this was what I think is pretty genius. So then the captain decided that he was going to turn the plane around in a full circle to see if the lights would follow him or if he would pass it or if it would, if he would, if he would lose, if he would lose it from the window, like when he's looking out, if he's turning and yeah. it's following him, that's kind of creepy. And it did follow no. him. Um, air traffic control couldn't see anything when the plane originally turned around, but within five minutes, they were able to see UFOs side by side with each other next to the plane, following it for 10 minutes. Ew, this is horrible, Em. I'm scared. The lights kept, and then all of a sudden they heard, Akon, oh Slim Shade. Convict. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god and then oh and oh the beautiful no wonder there were pulsating lights it was like my whole high school homecoming was, dance floor it, it was just it was just the club on a happy hour get in over florida, it in florida some salmon lights in the beautiful. salmon lights. we were just in key west some get over sexy it sexy key west dance club yeah uh so the lights uh in the club they kept in speed as the jet moved again and uh basically when the jet was about 80 miles north of Anchorage, all of a sudden the lights vanished. Ooh, I, ooh, I wonder why. I, I also wonder why. Um, this is a very long quote, but this is, uh, I mean, I just literally told you the whole story, but this quote is the 
exact report from Captain Tarachi, which I feel like should be heard. Yeah. There's also some little details in here. So this is the whole experience according to Captain Tarachi. The distance from the lights uh, was far enough from us, and we felt no immediate danger. I thought perhaps it was a UFO, and the lights were still moving strangely. Most unexpectedly, two spaceships appeared directly in front of the plane, shooting off lights. The spaceships, which he called it a spaceship, the spaceships fired jets to, quote, kill the inertia of their high-speed maneuver. After this... Uh, the ships appeared as if they were stopped in one place in front of us, and at the time, one ship was above the other. Then three to seven seconds later, okay, <laughs> uh, a light, a fire, like from jet engines, stopped and became a small circle of lights as they began to fly level at the same speed as we were. So it's almost like it shot itself off, then it halted, then it had these little lights, and it was defying gravity the whole time. I just feel like they're always showing off these spaceships. They really are flashy with it, aren't they? Right? Yeah. I mean, it's just trying to fly in and land uh, next to my apartment for my 30th birthday. (laughs) Linda called the UFO rental company. Oh, my my God. My mom called uh, the International Space Station and FAA and said, like, look, we need a crash landing on this 30th. (laughs) I need a real fucking light show. You hear me? (laughs) So uh, uh, where am I? So from the middle of the body of the ship, uh, uh, from the middle... Of the body, uh, a ship sparked an occasional stream of lights, like a charcoal fire from right to left, from left to right. Its shape was square, flying 500 feet to 1,000 feet in front of us. Um, Its size was about the same size in the body of a DC-8 jet with numerous exhaust pipes. So this thing wasn't tiny. Like, this was like a big fucking jet. Right, right. Um, The inside cockpit shined brightly, and I felt the warmth of the UFO's thrusters on my face. Whoa, okay. So, like, from your own fucking plane, you can feel the heat. It is impossible for any man-made machine to make a sudden appearance in front of a jumbo jet that's flying 910 kilometers per hour and to move along in a formation paralleling our aircraft. But we did not feel threatened or in danger. Honestly, we were simply astounded. I have no idea why they came so close to us. There was a pale white flat light in the direction where the ships flew away. So they almost like left a trail. Oh my god! I'm nervous about this wine <clears throat> being skunked in the in the downstairs <laughs> compartment. Now that it's all been heated up by That's the thrusters. That's what I'm telling. I'm I'll take it if it's if it's not you know suitable for sale. I'll take it. But it <laughs> seems you'll, like you'll... it might get skunked. You'll test it all. Yeah, I'll try it. Right. I'll be controlled. Don't worry. Just just drop Quality land control. All, all the barrels. Just have Tell them Linda hit. to reroute the UFO this <laughs> way. <laughs> Bring the barrels to Kentucky. Christine's going to handle it. I'm ready. Um, so then after those little spaceships vanished, the, the crew noticed a much larger disc-shaped craft with a pale ring of light now tailing them, matching their speed and their distance and their altitude. Ooh. So it's gotten worse now. Great. <laughs> so uh, the Anchorage uh, Air Traffic Center couldn't see. Uh, they couldn't see it. So they set their radar scope to 25 nautical miles. So they broadened their range. And all of a sudden, they could see it. This mm. was a quote from the Anchorage Center saying, Then there it was on the screen. A large green round object had appeared seven or eight miles away. We arrived at the sky above the Eelson Air Force Base in Fairbanks. And it was a clear night. We were just above the bright city lights and we checked the pale white light behind us. There was a silhouette of a gigantic spaceship and we got away quickly. Oh my gosh. That is freaky deaky. Basically, as they were coming into this town, Fairbanks, and the lights from the city were kind of uh, getting closer and closer, it was showing more and more of this ufo behind them it was like the glow was helping them see what the hell was following them and it was this massive fucking ufo um to a point where uh captain tarachi even called it the mothership oh i like how earlier he was like it might have been one of those things they call ufo and now he's like (laughs) it's the mothership like where did he get this lingo all of a sudden (laughs) He went, speaking of mothership, now Linda is walking herself <laughs> off of the, the bridge of the UFO. She's like, a mothership? Who called for me? <laughs> the Linda ship? Excuse me. <laughs>
Okay. So the other day my sister came over and I was like, Oh, that's nice. She wanted to visit me. And she's like, Hey, did your fab fit fun box come? Because <laughs> she requested the, the cute pink fuzzy slippers. Like they're like little slides. We have those now. We yeah. Have them too. And my sister was like, are they here yet? And I was like, yes. And so that was basically the purpose that she came over, but fab fit fun has become very fab fit and fun for me, for my 16 year old sister. And they're passionate about showcasing amazing women. They have 16 female founded brands in the winter box, which is so awesome. And um, makes you feel good while also getting the best kind of stuff for your house and your feet, I guess. Allison also has the slippers. And now every time that she walks into a room, I hear, ch, 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 <laughs> and I know, I know she's got her Fat Fit Fun slippers on. Uh, order your winter box today. Sign up now so you can snag amazing pr- uh, products like the slippers, as, <laughs> as, as I'm going to keep them from now on. Uh, and you can use coupon code DRINK for $10 off your first box at www.fabfitfun.com. Again, order your winter box today. Sign up so you can snag amazing products like the slippers. So use coupon code DRINK for $10 off your first box at fabfitfun.com. So we're very excited that Canva is one of our sponsors now because Em was just saying, Christine, didn't you make our first tote bag designs on Canva like years ago? And I was like, oh my God, Em, you're right. I made our, and I've been using Canva, Canva almost every day since like we started the podcast. It's an easy to use design platform. It has everything you need to design like a pro. It makes everything you do look really professional. No matter what you're creating or sharing, Canva Pro has everything you need in one place, including a collection of over 75 million premium photos, videos, audio, and graphics. Yeah. My favorite Canva pro feature is that you can design, like say, if you want to do Instagram stories, they have templates for that. They have templates. If you want to do like invitations, so design like a pro (laughs) me with Canva (laughs) pro (laughs) right now, you can get a free 45 day extended trial. When you use our promo code, just go to canva.me slash A T W W D to get your free 40 day extended trial. That's C A N V A dot M E slash A T W W D canva.me slash A T W W D. So it's so big that uh, Captain Tarachi is even saying that it was, quote, twice the size of an aircraft carrier. And just for um, context, Jesus, that's huge. For a context, an aircraft carrier holds 64 aircraft. Holy crap. And it said it was twice the size of an aircraft carrier. So it must have just completely blanketed the sky, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. And I, and I um, hate that <clears throat> it's like so care- precision controlled. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's so massive, but it can just like to the exact dimension. Also that- something that massive, like halting itself in space like yes. that, like going from super fast to just not moving. Like, yeah. It just like doesn't abide by gravity. It's like, no, no that's not how this works. Uh, Tarachi actually later made a drawing of it. And the official documents say that it's walnut shaped. But if you look at it, it literally is the shape of a fucking lemon. It's no! literally <laughs> like it's got these big bulges my baby it's this big bulges above and below with a wide brim and like two little knots i mean it's literally a fucking lemon what if that literally was lemon what if lemon that was lemon's entrance onto this came to earth yeah Instead and he was a... like, oh, nothing here is this big. I need to shrink up. And he went too far. He, he like, mummified. Ant- <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, he ant manned himself. And then he like rolled under a bed. It's like, in, <laughs> it's like, wait in a minute. A, on ancient aliens when they're like, is this shrunken head, the shrunken head of an alien? It's like, no, but <laughs> maybe if it's lemon. Ugh. Well, anyway, it's literally lemon bringing Linda to earth, I, I think. Um, it was following the line. I don't understand what's confusing about any of this. Oh it all God, makes it was, sense all of a sudden. It really, it was literally a big ass lemon following all the Just wine. trying to get a hold of an entire plane. Are you line. actually the captain of this ship? I'm ha- confused. I was waiting for you to finally put the pieces together. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wait, come back. <laughs> uh, so according to the flight engineer, this UFO was... Abs- quote absolutely different to the first ones uh which had the clusters of undulating oh, yeah. lights um so the radar uh, at the airport nearby failed to even register this massive object probably it was like too big to even they probably thought that was just like the default sky <laughs> the or clouds, something yeah like something <laughs> mass the default sky yeah. you know what i mean uh so faa investigators actually deemed the crew because basically their radars weren't picking it up. And this is when FAA decided that they were actually going to like do an investigation because uh, air traffic control was even offering military intervention. Uh, the captain actually said, no, I don't want the military involved because he had heard of this other incident called the Mantell incident, which we should cover at some point, 
where apparently there was a pilot that was pursuing a UFO and taking action and he died. <gasps> oh, um, shit. Oh. I don't know any more than that, but I could look into that. But basically he heard about that and he was like, uh, I don't want to <laughs> pursue this fucking UFO. No. So like, don't bring the military into it. I don't want someone else to accidentally die. So uh, enough people can't explain this, that the FAA does a thorough investigation. They deemed the crew, quote, normal, professional, rational, and did not have a drug or alcohol involvement. So They hadn't drunk like half the wine in the... <laughs> all of the wine was still there. Um, <laughs> they didn't replace it with water <laughs> like teenagers do. <laughs> it was still there. It was just in their bellies instead of bottles. Um, so anyway, the investigation led to... Um, I guess the official reason that they had an investigation of people asked is because there was, quote, a violation of airspace. Okay. Which, like, I feel like I could use that the next time someone, like, has, like, negative vibes. I can be like, you're a violation <laughs> of my airspace. Wait, I love that. Excuse me, you're actually <laughs> violating my airspace? Like, especially after quarantine, like, we're all going to need our own airspace to be very I mean, clear. Is that not, like, so uh, predictive of, like, uh, social distancing? Of, yes, like, Get out of my airspace. You're violating my airspace. I love that. So anyway, now maybe post-COVID we'll have a shirt that says that. Um, I actually, Eva, can you write that down? I love that quote. I almost wrote it down myself. I was like, why would I do that when we have an Eva? We Um, have an Eva. Eva, Eva, write that down. Can you make sure to write something about violating our airspace? Um, She probably wrote it down when she first heard it and was like, yeah, guys, I get (laughs) how this works. So during the investigation, Captain Tarachi was based in Anchorage and actually became a, sort of a celebrity in town because Ooh. of the sighting. And only a month later, actually, Japan Airlines grounded him and moved him to an office job because they found out he was talking to reporters. Oh, my God. That's not very nice. Which makes it shady, though, because they were like, we're literally going to. It's almost like that the cop who knows too much all of a sudden gets the desk, desk job. Desk duty. Yeah. You know, mm. so it's eerie that they're like, we don't want you to be talking to people too about close this. to the truth. Yeah. So the month after that, he ends up telling F- the FAA anyway that he thinks the mothership intentionally stayed in the darkest side of the sky and like mm. kept because he kept seeing it, but not being able to really see it because the he can only see it through like the glow of the lights, but he can never get a real full image of what right. this thing was. And so he thinks they were intentionally in the dark because they didn't want to be seen. Oh, I just got with him. Which brings up your point of, like, do you think, like, they popped up when all of a sudden they got mentioned? It's like, so it's, it's like, well, did yeah. they want to be hidden or did they like playing this game of, like, oh, we'll show ourselves briefly, but Because you think not that they would be. know that they've been seen at some point, right? Like. I think we're all under the, the, I think we've given aliens the stereotype that they have the power to read our minds at all times. True, and if, true. And if we see it, we know it sees us seeing it. So. Maybe they don't have that power, which Maybe I they're refuse just to like, believe. I don't know. We're just lost. And we're like, they're reading my <laughs> mind. <laughs> yeah, that's entirely possible that we're giving them like ridiculous parameters. And they're like, we're just like you. But for some reason, I have a feeling that, uh, well, because you hear about those stories where people are like, I saw it and suddenly it like zoomed toward me or what? Like, it, yeah, I feel like you hear those stories where they do read your mind. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. know. So uh, anyway, the captain himself says he thinks that it, they wanted to be seen. Uh, this is another quote, but he thinks the UFO wanted to hide while looking at them in the four, 747 uh, ah. because they had, quote, in front of the sunset, invisible for any movement we made. So it was always keeping Captain Chirachi's plane. Uh, it was almost like they were intentionally backlighting themselves so that yeah. they could always see Captain Chirachi, but Captain Chirachi could never see them. Oh, so creepy. He did also tell the FAA in official documents that he hopes, quote, we humans will meet them in the near future. No, thanks. No, thank you, Cap. I'm going to love you guys from afar, but you're violating my airspace and I'd like you to step back. We'll talk about you uh, on the podcast, but just tune in from space, please. Yeah, from the safety of our microphones, but that's it. Don't so, come any closer. When asked why UFOs would be interested at all and in even interacting with him, Captain Tarachi said, and I quote, we were carrying Beaujolais, a very famous wine. <laughs> oh, my God. They are under me. They're like, this alien must be. Oh, my God. Wait, I just realized something. What? It was fucking Xenon. <gasps> <laughs> How do we not make that connection? It was she borrowed Xenon. Daddy's Jag 
to get all the way to the fanciest wine that she could find. She's within, like, excuse me. <laughs> she was like, um, excuse me, there's apparently like 770,000 pounds of this wine It's here. my birthday month and I would love it, to have a little sippy sip. Excuse the lights. We're having a little bit of a party limo situation <laughs> over here. A party limo. I love, it's a party lemon. Hang on. I have to write a lot of this down. Eva, can you write all of this down, please? This is truly, and that's why we drink fucking fever dream. This is Xenon chaos. is driving a, a lemon to the wine. <laughs> And Zenon's also driving eleven, yeah. I'm I follow. So far I follow. Everyone else has slowly lowered the volume on this podcast. And by slowly I mean halted it. Fucking press pause everyone's and like stop partner, and delete. Everyone's partner or roommate who's like, Yeah, okay, fine, I'll listen to one episode is like, really? And you're like they're like, No, I promise they don't always talk like they don't always scream about their moms. <laughs> Except for you'd be lying, because that's all that we do. We'd be lying. Lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, Linda's tiger and bears. I can't get it together. Okay, anyway, this is Xenon. This is the story of how Xenon came to Earth. I don't know how we didn't figure out it was her birth story, like, earlier, but here it is. Beautiful. Some people obviously dispute this UFO claim, me included. Uh, (laughs) The second you said Xenon, I began to dispute it. Um, (laughs) The second I said lemon, don't kid yourself. But there was a, so in 1987, there was uh, one article written by this like skeptic journalist named Philip J. Glass. And I feel like I've mentioned him before. I don't know if he's as big as I'm putting him in my mind, but I feel like Philip J. Glass was like kind of on every fucking case to dispute aliens. Um... But so this is a quote from him about why he thinks that uh, this story is not true. Um, <clears throat> so Philip said, quote, astronomical calculations of that night show that when the pilot claimed to see the UFO, Jupiter was extremely bright and was visible precisely where the pilot reported he saw the UFO. Mars was just below and to the right of Jupiter and may explain the initial report that he saw two lights. This is not the first time that an experienced pilot has mistaken a bright celestial body for a UFO, nor will it be the last. I think that the Japanese pilot, first of all, why do we have to say the Japanese pilot, the pilot, I think that the pilot should have been a little more skeptical when the United Airliner and the Air Force plane reported seeing nothing. Um, yeah, you know what? Even the second he said the Japanese pilot, it's like when people say a female pilot. It's like, yeah, there. That why? What's the qualifier for? What are you trying to say here? Yeah, exactly. So uh, anyway, I I'm not on Philip's side right now. No, Phil, but, you're, uh, just step, sit down. Phil, I'm really mad uh, at Phil right now. <laughs> he, uh, but yeah. So he basically said like they were actually just planets, and this is not the first time a pilot has mistaken that as a UFO. Uh, okay. One of the times that that actually has also happened, just a fun fact, in World War II, there was a, a big chaos because a bunch of B-29 pilots that were in the Pacific, they were flying at night and reported this mysterious ball of fire, and they thought it was like long-range aircraft that was going to try to shoot at them. Oh. And then they ended up finding out it was Venus. Were they um, shooting at Venus? That would they were. Really... They were literally no! shooting. Oh, can you imagine later they being were like, like sorry, reporting to your officer and being like, um, so awkward. <laughs> So can we still write off all those bullets? Yeah, because yeah. What, do we get more ammo? How does this work? They literally, for a long time, were shooting at fucking Venus, being like, I don't get it. They won't back down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, so anyway, uh, the Anchorage Daily News, they also said, according to Philip J. Class. Uh, I thought it was Glass. Class with a K. Oh, I thought you said Glass, which... Philip no. Glass is like a composer, so I was like, if this is the same guy, he needs to stick to one fucking lane. Oh okay, no! Class. Anytime I think of Glass, I think of George Glass, which was Jan Brady's fake boyfriend. That always makes That's me laugh. That's right, George Glass. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so Class, Class, like knockoff, like class. the knockoff Class, like K, like with a K instead of a C. Got it. Um, so Anchorage Daily News says that according to Class. The uh, the pilot never reported seeing Jupiter or Mars, even though they were clearly visible. In fact, when uh, the co-pilot was asked if he could distinguish the lights as being different from a star, he said no. Oh. So that makes it seem like a credible dispute of like, well, you couldn't even tell when we were giving you a test yeah. on it. You couldn't even tell the difference. So how can we trust that you hmm. didn't know what it was? I guess my question um, is like, then why? 
I mean, I have a lot of questions, but I'm, maybe I'll get to them. But, like, if it's on the – okay, first of all, it was seen on the radar briefly, right? So, like, what mm-hmm. were they seeing then if they saw mm-hmm. two? And then also, like, I get that, oh, the light looks like something uh, right. out of the, out of space. But also, if you're feeling like it's stopping and you see jets and you feel the heat, I mean, this is all just really specific. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I guess uh, – well, let me let me say this first. So, other skeptics have said that uh, the UFOs could have been optical illusions caused by ice crystals, and I guess sometimes, like the, maybe if it's like a reflection off of a cloud, it almost looks like a thick actual object. So a radar could have maybe picked it up. I'm oh. not really sure. I'm I'm not sure. I'm just trying to guess off of like a reflection plus clouds. Something could have looked like something else. Um, other people though say that Captain Sirachi already established himself as a ufo believer in the past which makes him look biased because Mm. he had logged several other sightings before Mm. um but to the point that you're making uh the event wasn't just witnessed by him who was a believer it was all three crew members who said that they had this experience and that the radar did pick up signals of something at around eight miles away and the radar display uh did show a color strength i guess based it's called like an echo but uh based on the strength of the signal of something else next to you it goes from either like green all the way up up to red for a really strong signal um i guess also fun fact planes use this to for potential upcoming turbulence that's how they're able to say like oh we're gonna get a little bit of turbulence in a little bit so just be prepared for that they can see it through like this like echo radar or whatever which like I sure wish they gave, like, portable versions of that to... Uh, Absolutely. To, to the people sitting on the plane. So if I saw a big-ass red dot coming my way, I would know to pray versus, Yeah, but can like, you imagine, like, everybody on the plane suddenly sees a red dot coming at them? It would be fucking chaos. I, I would I be mean, so would many be... clonop and deep. I would be <laughs> I would be using, like, the phone on the back of the plane to be, like... Uh, at least you could... You could <laughs> phone... Oh, do, I wonder if, like... I wonder... How, how many people don't actually know what we're talking about? Oh, uh, yeah, the they're like, <laughs> phone on the plane? I'm like, for Candy Crush? No, like the ones where you put your credit card in it? Never mind. No. Um, <laughs> yikes. <laughs> okay, that makes me old. Uh, but wow, yeah, I, I, I'm glad actually nobody has radar ability because if you saw that your neighbor holding one of those and there's like a red blinking dot coming at you like uh uh-uh. uh yeah it wouldn't be cute for my psyche but it could i could properly time my anti-anxiety meds though like i I'd just be take like, it just i'm like, like oh when when do i take that ambient oh right now got it <clears throat> that's why you take anyway. it the second the engine starts going and then you're fine okay you're clear <laughs> do you need me to give you another lesson before our next tour i thought I've, i thought we've gone through this multiple times <laughs> christine no i i lost all of my lessons because you would always go up to the delta first fucking class whatever <laughs> and eva and i would sit at a coffee it's not bean. my fault that a year into us touring i was like well what are your guys reward numbers and you're like i don't have one and i was like you could have literally been getting rewards miles on every single flight we took and probably been up there with me sorry uh, that i'm savvy and frugal okay my my mother with the fucking ponies at a birthday party. i'm telling you she, she should have taught you this early she should have and I think she did and I wasn't listening because she was furious at me when she found out that it took me so long to like she get up. She probably found out I was up there and you were not and was like what ha-? and I'm like I tried to tell them I said get a rewards number I'll plug it in when I book our flights. Also my Delta thing my dad see speaking of which my mom and dad got me one in 1992 so I was like <laughs> six months old and they got me one because they were like I have a feeling she'll need this someday. And like, that's a genius are. move though. If you have a baby, just set them up now. It's because true. Like, I, it literally says like a member for thir- 29 years. And I'm like, that's really creepy, but it's, <laughs> I guess it's true. Me and Eva is like three months. And also here's a, <laughs> because here's Chris- a shitty fucking muffin for you to split between the two. Yeah, of you. And it's like minor parent. Christine <laughs> Schieffer has signed them up because they refuse to do it themselves. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> so I'm not going to stand by and get shit on for that. I do miss me and Eva's uh, encounters at the airport because we would always, for some reason, find each other before we ran into you at the airport. And I'd be like, she's probably up in her fucking lounge. Just like, <laughs> I was she's... because they have free mimosas and I'm a cheap skate. <laughs> uh, okay. So anyway, they're, the radar. My mom's having a heart attack somewhere. Like, I did not raise you like this. And Linda's somewhere like. I think my children got switched at birth. <laughs> I pray to God my mom does not listen to this episode. I'm oh, roasting she's her. Freak out. <laughs> she's 
it's going to be like, that's it. No more exotic no animals birthday. for you. Only ponies from now Only on. Only ponies. Uh, <gasps> so, well, also, ugh, never mind. I won't, I, we won't derail anymore. Um, <laughs> but so the, the radar, the echo turbulence thing, uh, it shows a really strong radar is red and a really weak one is green. And all three of them remember seeing that the UFO blip was green. So it's good that they can all confirm each other's stories, but it's also interesting that something that fucking massive, which should have definitely showed up as True. red. But then there's the counter argument of like, well, if it's defying physics, it could also True. Defi- like it could also go against our own technology and it could be in like a stealth mode and hiding itself. Like anything's um, possible. Yeah. So it's anyway so captain uh tarachi disagreed with class's opinion obviously and said it wasn't a weather phenomenon it wasn't a star it moved with us um and ultimately the air force just kind of deemed this as like random clutter and just kind of swept <laughs> under the carpet space junk <laughs> <laughs> your random clutter but also you're violating my airspace yeah Hey, uh, listen, one man's space junk is another man's uh, random clutter. aggressive UFO following, <laughs> following you through the skies, chasing your so, wine. Chasing your wine. So Captain Tarauchi was uh, instated as a pilot later, but he did report a second UFO in the same space years later. So it's a kind, it's depending on what side you're on. It's like, oh, see, yeah. it came back. Or, or it's like, oh, so now you're... You're seeing it again. There's more ice though. crystals. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So basically, in the same area, uh, he was later smile. Uh, he was later flying a similar route, and he radioed to um, air traffic control. Please record this. Irregular lights looks like a spaceship. This is like pilot who cried UFO. <laughs> like I feel like That's you have exactly to be really it. careful with these calls now because you already have a rep, like a bad rep for for this kind of a sighting. Mm-hmm. It's like you got to really, you got to really be ready to defend uh-huh. your, your case here. Mm-hmm. So this time there was no unexplained radar and others on board could not confirm that they saw a UFO mm. and officials said that it was just village lights bouncing off of ice crystals. So it was more ice crystals, like you said. Maybe it's good they gave him desk duty. Now I'm like, I don't know if I want this man flying my wine around <laughs> if he's like seeing like, UFOs. I think he is sneaking the wine. Hang on yeah, a second. Yeah, something's going on. Uh, so basically what ended up happening to him is he's probably like 81 now and he retired in... Uh, Kanto, North Kanto, Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, one article a few years ago said that he lives with his wife and doesn't talk about the UFO if he can avoid it. um, Because he said, I spoke to a doctor. He said it was just an illusion. But his wife is like the perfect uh, catering wife and was quoted saying, you saw something you just weren't meant to see. So it's like, (gasps) oh, that's a great way of putting it, though. Yeah. So she's just super supportive because it is true. Like, you weren't meant to see the reflection of ice crystals. You weren't meant to see natural phenomena and your eyes just caught it in the wrong moment. Or you saw an alien and you weren't fucking supposed to. And guess to. what? You'd- no one was ready for it and they don't believe you. So yep. it didn't help. So the FAA did an in-depth report of Flight 1628. Um, and it has, in this report, it has primary references, interviews, written records, photos, drawings, recordings, a chronology of the events, the printout of Anchorage's uh, air traffic that night, and it has the FAA form 3112, which is the inspection and surveillance record. Um, and you can actually buy all of this. You can s- see the report yourself, um, but the FAA charges about 200 bucks for the complete yeah. package. Come on. Um, but guess who's a member of MUFON? And Bro. I, so What's I wanted your discount? To, so, <laughs> well, no. So I, like, I have access to, like, remember you can, like... E- uh, I talked about it last episode where you can basically look through the log of like any reported UFO yeah. and see everything. So I tried to go, I tried to use MUFON and look up this. It was November 17th, 1986 in Alaska. So I looked it up. But remember last episode, I also told you that MUFON like is not, is not uh-huh. on top of their tech. He's on angelfire.web or whatever. Yeah. I mean, literally something from 1986 that hasn't been reported. And uh. it's like apparently a big case. So um, it's really, I don't know if it's outdated or it's just not well organized. I don't know what the deal is, but I've tried looking it up. It's not in MUFON's records. But I will say I, I looked up for all of 1986 in Alaska. There were two hits. 
And one of them actually was on November 17th. So what's what's interesting oh. for me, for me with my you know check with my fact checking, it's interesting that the only other UFO sighting happened to be on the same day. Did they day. Have put it on the wrong year, or is it just a different, completely different story? This is a completely different oh, story, wow. but it almost kind of confirms that like something was going on that day well, in and Alaska. Well, he saw it another time. Didn't the guy see it another time? Maybe not the same day, but in the same spot, right? He similar? said he's. He did, but there was like no real evidence sure, of it. Sure, okay. At least the the that flight sixteen twenty eight, it was like, yeah, we can't explain it. That's kind of weird. Yeah, yeah. But so there was two hits for all of nineteen eighty six in Alaska. Um, both of them happened to be in November, which is weird. Yeah. One of them happened to be the same day that flight sixteen twenty eight happened, and this is the the information that someone logged. I don't know if I'm allowed to read it, but I'm gonna do it. Um, so. This is the report for November 17th that's on MUFON's site. I was driving north uh, when I noticed a glowing ball floating above the water in the inlet. I thought that it may have been a helicopter spotlight, but it was very foggy and it was much lighter and a different color. It only followed at the same speed as my vehicle. I was mostly amazed at what I was seeing. It was something that I'd never seen before. It glowed a yellowish white color. salmon No. Uh, mm, a I don't really, know. really rotten, bad salmon. But I hate that. <laughs> if your salmon looks a, like that, a Dijon, actually, a Dijon uh, mustard, maybe. I was, uh, I was mostly amazed at what I was seeing. It had a, gl- it glowed a yellowish white color that illuminated the surroundings of my vehicle. I believe the fog also enhanced the effect. I then felt as if I had fallen asleep, but I was a few miles down the road from where I was driving, and uh, when I looked at the ocean to see the object. It had disappeared. I never told anyone until a couple years ago. I never felt compelled to share my experience, but recently have had very strong thoughts about it. Mm-hmm. And the other strange thing is the loss of time during the sighting. It seemed that I had been sleeping and woke up 20 minutes later, but I never did. I didn't fall asleep, but the time somehow went by. Hope this helps. Hope this helps. It does. You and can, stranger. So that was that happened on the same day. It doesn't what sound year? like they were. Same day, same. This was the exact same time. Oh, the same year, too. I thought this just happened to be the same day, like, on a different year. No, oh, I think that's, that's why weird. I kept I think that's why I kept repeating it, because I felt like you weren't uh, giving me no, the reaction I No, I thought you just meant, like, another November 16th, but I didn't realize, like, no, literally so I, that day. So it was November 17th, 1986. And oh, oh, oh. So through MUFON, I just looked up all of 1986 wow, in Alaska. Wow, that is weird. Okay. And the only two hits in Alaska were of 1986 were both in November. That is weird. I see what you're saying now. Although yeah. you could say like, well, Jupiter was really strong that day. Maybe this person also saw the reflection. Bada but Bada but you're, you're right that it is really weird that two people would have a sighting on the same day in the same place. And the other one, because I said there were two hits. One was definitely on the same day as 1628. And the other one that just said November 1986 is also probably from the same day because <gasps> this is their story. This is from, excuse me, Wasilla, Alaska. This is the, the thing. Still feels like yesterday. I was nine years old. My mother had put us to bed, but I'm a night owl and I've always loved the stars. I was watching out the bedroom window, watching a big orange star. Orange. Orange. <laughs> Salmon. We're getting closer. <clears throat> um, well, I thought it was a star. As it got closer, it was really hot, giving off the heat oh. of a sun. Almost like how he felt the UFO thrusters. The next thing I remember, I was on a metal table. Okay, now we've crossed the line. Not strapped down, but I couldn't move a bit as if I was being restrained. And the surrounding, they, they were surrounding the table. I was screaming and all of a sudden my voice wasn't coming out of my mouth, but it was inside my head. And it was so loud that I stopped. They had mouths, but they didn't use them to communicate. They were talking to me inside my head. They proceeded to poke and prod me through my belly button and between my toes. No! They seemed to be trying to soothe me by stroking my forehead like my mother did when I didn't feel good. I don't recall how I got back in my bed, but when I opened my eyes, I was drenched as if I had jumped in a pool. I immediately ran to my mother's room and began to tell her what had happened. She was quite freaked out, but did believe me, which is nice. She still. We still talk about it from time to time, but we've always wondered what happened. I was recently watching the History Channel, and I saw an episode of the Japan airline flight over Anchorage (gasps) in 1986. I just got chills. And I was frozen in shock. I looked at my husband and said, that's the UFO that took me. 
So Literal ultimate goose cam. I so, do not know what to do with myself right now. So Flight 1628 wasn't mentioned on MUFON site, but the only two reports for all of 1986 in Alaska both happened on the same day, allegedly. I'm really afraid. See, this is... I don't even like to look at, like, alien stuff because it's like, I feel like the second I notice it, it's like they're going to take me on a table and put something in my belly button. Like, I don't know. I don't like, I don't like, I feel like the more I think about it, the more likely it is to happen. (gasps) Well, anyway, there you have it on uh, Japanese Airlines Flight 1628 and also a lot of wildly thick tangents this this day. Wildly thick boys, yeah. They they weren't just little, little, uh, little moments. They were experiences they weren't so. little spirals they were giant tornadoes they sure were. tunnels funnels yes <laughs> tunnels uh, and funnels wow. there you go um that is wild okay i'm t- i'm so scared of aliens dude i'm so scared of them I'm i so know scared. i know I'm and sweating, i don't blame like, you aggressively <laughs> i one time went to a um akashic record reading before i even knew what it was and before i had like obviously taken any courses in it and they told me that i was part of the Lem- okay i've never said this on the podcast because goodbye I, what are you I, about to say i don't know if i've told you but uh they said oh you have a connection to the lemurians is that what Shut- no no sorry not the lemurians sorry that was the wrong one that was the one oh my you, the God. pleiadians okay that's even creepier because i don't know what that is okay let me and they were like oh does that mean anything to you and i was like kind of but i don't know why and then i looked it up and i was like i've looked this up in like high school for some reason but then i got really freaked out because she kept describing like how some people are part of pleiadian star system i I got really freaked out but then i took ended up taking akashic record reading classes um but anyway, so she said I was part of the Pleiadian star seed or something. So if anyone knows what that means, hit me up because I was too scared. <laughs> if you're to ask. also a part Pleiadian, uh, according Maybe to your ancestry cousins. account, let me know. <laughs> If you're 23 and me, lets me know that you're a Pleiadian. Yeah, also, maybe you were related. I, I wonder, does it have to do anything with like the theory that like aliens helped build the Egyptian pyramids? I don't know, because I've also heard that's like a very problematic theory because it doesn't give credit to um actual Egyptian civilizations who like (laughs) did actually do really intense work um so i've definitely heard that that's not like a really a great argument i don't think that's actually the same thing though i'm pretty sure this is the idea that like they lived on a different star system and then some of them like reincarnated on earth like they're they're Mm, different interesting um, people this is why i never told on the show i'm like i'm gonna sound so looney tunes and there's gonna be someone listening for the first time going okay this is way weirder than spotify led me to believe you're on you talk about a lemon all the fucking time there's really (laughs) nothing that could shock me at this point so well if anyone knows who the like about the pleiadians they like pleiades is where they come from i think anyway it doesn't matter okay okay freaky stuff though i just it's something about it if anything i'm just jealous that i'm not part alien maybe you are maybe i am i'll do another akashic reading for you and maybe we'll find you owe me about 20 i do owe you a lot yeah i uh will do one maybe we can do them i I can do it over zoom maybe i know i say this every time but you have to you have to ask me i'm not allowed to offer it that's part of christine i ask you every single time we talk about akashic records but you never say it like hey do you have time tomorrow afternoon to do like okay say it on the show and then it's never like I'll send agenda. an alarm to regularly text you that. And then the day you say yes, it will be the day that okay, we Okay, you can maybe ask Eva to schedule it for us, and then it'll be official. See? Eva, we can write, finally force Eva to... Eva, write down that I'm free all of my life. Um, <laughs> okay. And well, then figure it out with Christine. Let me know. Write down that I'm always at the doctor's, but anytime I'm not, <laughs> we can do one. <laughs> uh, Eva, if Christine's asking, I'm actually not available. I'm washing my hair. I'm busy. You're wildly so. busy as, all the time. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I have a story for you today, and that's uh, very disturbing and um, problematic in a lot of ways, so I just want to warn everybody, this is a toughie, um, but it's also really fascinating and touches on a lot of uh, uh, issues, modern day issues that still apply. So oh, this shit, is, okay. And I will also add that uh, the name um, for uh, one of these, the people involved, is Ethiopian, and I watched YouTube, I tried everywhere to find the pronunciation, 
everybody who does a episode or there's it's, it's not very common of a story but anybody who covers it says i don't really know how to pronounce this so there's really no uh clear clarity online as to how to say this so i apologize if i'm mispronouncing it um but the way i've uh have been saying it is sinedu s-i-n-e-d-u sinedu or sinedu S- s-e-i sorry s-i-n sin and then e-d-u maybe sinedu Sinadu? Sin- yeah, I don't know. My 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 gut instinct is to say Sinadu, but that's the American in me coming Sinidu. out. Yeah, I've been waffling between Sinidu and Sinadu, so I'm not sure. But then uh, her last name is Tedes. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, also takes place in the, well, not the 80s, I guess, in the 90s. Um, but it takes place May 28th, 1995. And we're just going to dive right into the story. So buckle up. Okay. What can you give a trigger warning for what content it is? Yes. Um, And I I do often hesitate to give trigger warnings because I feel like pretty much every story I cover deserves a trigger warning. And then I end up saying it for some stories and not for others. Is there, is there anything that is different? Um, I mean, not really. Uh, Okay. I don't know if this was like specifically child or animal abuse or something. No, I can't even do animal stuff anymore. It's really bad how like ridiculous. It's a suicidal, a suicide story, uh, stabbing. So like basically most stories I cover, which is really kind of fucked up. But um, But no, that's, I mean, it's, I, I, I'm sure that's quite a struggle you deal with all the time that there's like always something pretty dark that's gonna it's get covered tough because some people say like well you should give trigger warnings and i'm like i know but i feel like there's an umbrella trigger warning over the whole show because almost every story has some form of like either sexual assault or suicide right, or right. i mean and or children or i mean it's it's hard to kind of nail down every single story's uh trigger warnings but yes thank right. you for asking suicide definitely um and stabbing i guess is the other one which obviously both deserve a trigger warning yes um and you know just mental health issues in general so um this takes place in 1995 at harvard harvard okay harvard (laughs) are you sure harvard that's my midwest (laughs) accent um 26 year old tao nguyen uh woke up to a site that would be burned in her memory forever She was visiting Harvard, uh, specifically at the Dunster House, which was a dormitory, and had been staying over with her friend Trang Ho, who was a junior at Harvard. And so Tao had come to help Trang move out for the summer. So, uh, I'm sorry, Tao had come, yeah, Trang was moving out of the dorm, and her friend Tao had come to help her move out and was just staying a couple nights. Hmm. So Tao wakes up to a horrific sight. 8 a.m., Tao wakes up to the sight of her friend Trang being stabbed by her roommate, Sinadu Tades. Whoa. Who was another junior at Harvard. Uh, Tao later told the Herald, quote, I heard the screaming and I opened my eyes. According to Tao, Sinadu was looking, quote, crazy as she wordlessly stabbed her friend. And then obviously trying to like react and intervene as quickly as possible. Tao also got swiped by the knife herself, trying to grab it from sea to do and got uh, injured in the struggle, but thankfully survived. Um, she escaped and fled into the dormitory's courtyard where another Harvard junior later explained that to the Harvard Crimson newspaper, I woke up at 830 to hear a girl out in Dunster courtyard shrieking, someone's killed my friend, someone's killed my friend. And it went Fuck. on for three or four minutes. So Tao fled the scene uh, and Sinadu had stabbed her roommate Trang a total of 45 times <gasps> with a hunting oh my. knife. <gasps> oh my God. Why did that make it worse? I don't know. There's something like really hands-on and terrible about Hunt- this story. A hunting knife feels really intentional, I think. Like really? it's like, yeah. it's not like a spur of the moment. Let me grab a knife from the kitchen. It's like, no, I've got this from thing From the butcher that block. Is, yeah. Exactly. It's meant to fuck you up yeah like no one's going hunting at harvard as far as i'm concerned like that's just not an activity on the roster usually (laughs) it's not an elective you know i don't think so anyway i mean harvard has probably some pretty weird electives but i'm not sure that's one of them um but yeah so sinadu had stabbed her 45 times with a hunting knife that she had actually bought specifically for this murder so you're right it wasn't something she had on hand she had purchased a hunting knife uh presumably for to murder her roommate right 
Sinadu then barricaded herself in the bathroom and hanged herself from the shower rod. <gasps> wow. Yeah. It's just really upsetting, this whole story. Um, according to a Salon article called Satan Goes to Harvard, quote, the crime was stunning not only because it was savage, but because, as a Harvard official commented at the time, there was no apparent reason for it. Hmm. So now we're going to rewind and tell the story leading up to what the fuck happened on that morning. So Sina Du and Trang were both biology majors at Harvard in a course. Uh, it was like a pre-med course, basically, both uh, aiming for med school. Uh, both of them dreamed of becoming doctors so they could help others. They were also both admitted to Harvard on full scholarships. Sina Du Tedes was born on September 25th, 1975 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and had grown up in a pretty well-off family. I mean, I didn't get any intel as far as, like, how many tigers they would rent and, like, whether that was an option. Oh, my gosh. I'm, by the way, like, let's take the moment to say, like, I am still uh, so embarrassed that I even brought that story oh, up. come on. <laughs> I'm wearing my trashy, classy shirt because I embraced it. So you don't I know. have to apologize for the let things me, you say. Let me just do it. <laughs> let me just do a disclaimer real quick and be like, I'm very aware that, like, uh every parent is problematic in some way and uh mine chooses to uh make lavish requests like that but then i will say she does get educated i i don't like she she walked away from that conversation knowing that animal abuse is a real fucking thing and like no, tig- we love tiger king yeah. i don't want anyone thinking that like i like i'm i'm also just like a i don't think any of us think that you like i don't know tigers don't I, I know i just don't want people to think that i like I heard it and took it as like a serious request or like thought of it as like a real I mean, potential. You did have pony rides at your children's bir- at your own birthday party, which thank I'm God, thank God I blocked of. it from my memory, so I don't have to feel that one's not on me. I didn't choose that. <laughs> I mean, at 29, I'm like I'm jealous retroactively. I never went to a birthday with a pony ride, or maybe I well, did, and I was probably just jealous then too. Gosh, well, no, I'm, I'm. It's funny you mentioned it because in that exact moment, I was like, "Ooh, I really hate that I even brought it up because I just feel so stupid." But no, anyway, come on, people know you. People know <sighs> us. Okay, they don't think you're literally renting if, tigers. If I ever rented a tiger, it would be to secretly like help them escape and in then, the f- and then bring them back to to the wild or something. I don't okay, know. Okay, now you're going too far because people are going to say they're not meant for the wild just, and by the wild i mean it. to dr doolittle and, doc- <laughs> and who would feed them steaks and we would eat steaks together and um, that would in be the how first happened. episode of the podcast i literally talked about how my stepmom bought a bear from a catalog so i don't think anybody okay that's true. sitting here going wow em must be terrible like my that's stepmom true. literally ordered a bear and it arrived and she kept it in the playroom so i don't think uh this is, you know, next level from anything we've talked about. In- I know. Both I, our mothers have ordered animals off the internet. That's, or at least or yours. Thought to. Thought yeah, to. Yeah. No, I, I, I appreciate that. I'm just always a uh, parent of the people think that I'm not for the cause. And, uh, but anyway, I. M's, M's one of the people, you know, and wants person. to be one of the people. I do. And like, if I'm like, not one of the people, I'm certainly uh, looking through the window and wishing I was there. So. <laughs> yeah. M and I are just definitely not invited to be part of the people. We're just on the outskirts. Um, anyway, sorry. So she was raised uh, in Ethiopia in a relatively well-off family. But the uh, time that she lived in Ethiopia was kind of wrought with chaos and murder and violence. Uh, it was Ethiopia's Red Terror, which was a violent political repression campaign of the DERG, which was the provisional military government of Ethiopia, against other Marxist Leninist groups in Ethiopia. Mm. So there was a lot of mass murder, atrocities. Uh, corpses were dragged to families' doorsteps by soldiers Jesus who would Christ. then force the bereaved family to pay for the bullet so that they would have the body back. Yeah oh fuck that yeah it's it's just like really really dark times um so uh it was a regime in which quote the murderers had the power so that's kind of the social political environment that she grew up in um as part of the resistance group sinadu's father had been thrown in jail for two years when she was seven and he was kept as a political uh prisoner for a while um however during that time uh, her dad recalled that Sinadu was very cheerful, would visit her, uh, sorry, would visit her dad, would visit him in prison with her mother, who was a nurse. Um, and when she was little, Sinadu didn't really have many friends. She was kind of ostracized by people at her Catholic girl school, um, as well as her own family members as a child. So she was kind of just on the outskirts. 
Um, and to escape, she would devote herself to her studies. Uh, and she worked so hard at her academics that she was admitted to the prestigious International Community School where she graduated as valedictorian. And this was huge wow. because it gave her kind of the opportunity to leave uh, and go sure. to an American university. Not okay. the American University. That's where I went. It's nothing like Harvard. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, so she actually got, uh, she was accepted by 24 different American colleges. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. Um, One of them but, being Harvard. Jesus Christ. Yeah. But she decided to go with Harvard on a full scholarship. So like. Okay. Wow. Must be nice. Wow. <laughs> Must Congra- be nice. Congratulations. Em and I was... were literally like we could see Harvard from our apartments and we were so far removed from it. Like intellectually i think we so like... far removed. when my when i got into boston university i found out in the same i found out in the admissions office with my mom because we went to go look at apartments in case i got in and we decided to stop at bu and they told me i got in and my mom looked at me and went wow how did that happen <laughs> <laughs> so like uh... they, yeah harvard and i were just that, let's just put it this way. I didn't even try applying to Harvard. We weren't invited to apply to Harvard ever no. by anybody. Yeah, that's no. not, uh, that wasn't even on the table. Yeah. Not even, not on the radar. No. Uh, so she was accepted on a full scholarship to Harvard. And uh, a former teacher described her as the pearl of her school, her high school. And uh, however, this kind of became problematic, which seems to happen to a lot of people who start at a school like Harvard after being kind of the best at their high school and being the pearl or the special one, they go to a place like Harvard and it's sort of a wake up call. Like everybody is top of their class. Right. You're you're one of many. You're not th- the special, right. you know, as special as you were in high school anymore. And so I guess she had a little bit of a shock, culture shock in that way. Um, she struggled to keep up academically at first and she was extremely isolated. So she grew up pretty isolated, but at least like had her family and, uh, you know, knew her high school classmates and that kind of thing but she showed up at harvard and felt completely isolated and actually she became so desperately lonely that she got to the point where she started sending letters to strangers like from the phone book and she would just write letters randomly to people in the phone book and pleaded with them to befriend her which is just really heartbreaking um yeah that's really sad and yeah and this is also part of why the story is just very dark is like you just see what's building up to the, the murder suicide, and it's like right. somebody should have done something or or stepped in at some the, point. The behavior was off early on. Yeah, and like yeah. it was just so many cries for help, and nobody did anything. Cries for help, yes. Mm. Yeah. So in her letters, she wrote to strangers from the phone book. She wrote, year after year, I became lonelier and lonelier. I see friends deserting me. They would take every chance to show me they did not have any love or respect for me. High school turned out to be even worse. If I went early or left late, I would be roaming the yard or deserted hallways alone while other students roared with laughter or talked their heart out, standing in groups. Home was not a comforting place. I swallowed my pain and anguish just as my siblings did to theirs. I was so lonely, but I hung on tight because I wanted to come to the States in search of a solution. Mm. So finally she had gotten like what she worked so hard for and she arrives in the States and is still feeling completely isolated. So it didn't like, it almost made her problem worse um, of feeling left out. Wow. So one woman actually responded to the letters and uh, she wanted, she was like, okay, like I'll reach out, I'll reach back and uh, talk to you. But apparently she became so alarmed by the bizarre writings and recordings that Sina Du started sending her that she like cut off contact. Oh shit. So that didn't last. And then another woman found the letter obnoxious, quote unquote, and sent it, which is like, okay, fuck you. All yeah. right. Uh, and sent it to a friend who worked at Harvard to review. And so <gasps> literally at this point, Harvard has these letters and it knows that she's writing these things and does nothing. Wow. Oh my so gosh. So there's like full proof that they, this early on, already knew. They were aware of something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, although the letter was deemed to have been read by both the dean of the university and another university official, nobody ever contacted Sinadu about it, uh, never asked if she was okay, nobody ever said anything to her at all, and it was filed away and quickly forgotten about until suddenly it was very relevant uh, down the line. Mm. So, no one intervened, obviously nobody provided her with any sort of help that she clearly needed at this point. Um, And after her freshman year, Sinadu's roommate told her she would no longer be rooming with her. So sophomore year, Sinadu got a roommate by the name of Trang Ho. And this Uh becomes the victim in the story. Um, 
At age 10, so now I'm going to just give you a little background on Trang. Uh, Trang Phuong Ho had escaped from the communist repression in Vietnam on a fishing boat with her father and sister. And they'd actually done this once before when Trang was a baby, but she had fallen overboard oh, uh, of shit. the boat. Yeah, and her so her parents were like, her dad was like, let's wait till she's older. So when she was 10, they did it again and were able to escape to Indonesia, hmm. where she learned English in makeshift classrooms in a refugee camp. And only a few years after she arrived in the United States, this is really incredible, Boston Magazine chose her, along with uh, Governor William Feld and a uh, Cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church, as one of 25 people who can save Boston. So Whoa. she got... Oh my gosh. Yeah, she was literally named a- among like old white men as one of the people who could save the city of Boston, whatever That's that means. crazy. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so... Uh, what an achievement. And she basically at the time was working uh, as a volunteer at the Spalding Rehabilitation Center. She was tutoring Vietnamese refugees, supporting her mother and sisters by holding down two jobs while attending Boston Technical High School. Um, So she was among 16,000 high school seniors who applied to Harvard, and only two were given perfect scores by the university's admissions committee, and she was one of them. So she was kind of in a similar boat of like, full ride to Harvard, um, like big plans, going to be a doctor, change the world. Save Uh, Boston. Save Boston. Listen, I I didn't think it was possible for Boston to be saved. So that's (laughs) a pretty incredible article. (laughs) Save Boston from itself. I didn't even know the problems. Yeah. And the sad thing is, you know, she obviously passed away. And what do you think this cardinal saved Boston? This this Catholic priest? Um, I don't think so. Right. Uh, At least not by the time we got there. So... Very sad. Um, But yes, so she was valedictorian of her high school. And in her valedictorian address, she said, you decide where your life is going, whether you are going to make a difference or not. For me, I will make many differences. So yeah, she's just an incredible, incredible woman. Um, At Harvard, she also had a tough time because she she faced that same issue of showing up, being like listed as one of the top people in Boston. And Mm. all of a sudden she's there with people who also were, you know, in their towns, maybe we're going to save their town. I don't know. But we're the same kind of caliber of student right. as she was. So she she had like an A minus to B plus average. Um, so she was doing OK, but she was kind of struggling a bit. Um, since her freshman year at Harvard, she'd worked in a research laboratory at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, which is like a really top level place. Oof. Um, and she had appeared as co-author of a paper in the journal Genetics. So can you imagine you and I would be the biggest dumbasses at Harvard? It would be like a movie, like Dumb and Dumber, but I, like I'm, worse. I'm trying to think of like going to a dinner party and having to have a conversation with oh people my God. like that. It's where they're like, and what do you do? And I'd be like, don't. <laughs> it's a, it's okay. We don't have to talk about we'd it. Be like, they'd be like, what magazine were you listed as the, the crucial person to save the world? And we'd be like, well, one time like BuzzFeed put us on a listicle. Does that count? <laughs> Like, no. <laughs> Be like, uh, I don't know. Sometimes my mom tunes in to, like, my show. We were on a billboard, but we had to pay for it. Does yeah. that count? No. <laughs> because we have, like, issues. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, um, yep, yep, yep. So, basically, she's fucking killing it. Um, and her professor said in one of his meetings with her that uh, she came and said she was no longer a star, but that was okay because she had gotten into a very good lab. And I'm like, girl, you're still a star. Trust me. Like, you're just in a different caliber of people where you don't realize how much you stand out, but, like, you stand uh, out. Imagine all of those credentials and those accolades and being like, I mean, I'm not that great. And it's like, that, you know, that reminds me what? totally, though, of, like, of, like, imposter syndrome where it's just so difficult for a lot of people, cough, cough us to to feel like oh you're successful at something because it's like oh i'm just faking it or right it's, i'm not as good as the, all the other people in the same situation right um right. so it really shows you but yeah so <sighs> she's in a paper call a journal called genetics as like a freshman listen girl. and she's gonna save boston let's not forget that she's also gonna save the entire city of boston that's right. she's literally a superhero isn't like it's spider-man's whole job to protect new york yeah that's you know? right yeah so <sighs> man there you go incredible um so this is where their stories intersect. And Trang, sophomore year, got a new roommate named Sinadu. Excuse me, Tades. So 
Sina Du, for what it's worth, was incredibly fond of Trang, was very excited, basically thought like, finally, I found somebody I can be friends with. Exactly. And Trang herself was pretty popular and like well-liked and outgoing. Um, And so Sina Du started to become like really needy because she always kind of wanted to hang out, always needed attention. And so Trang started to get a little bit like, I want my, you're, 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 what is it? Infiltrating my airspace. What you're violating, that? violating my airspace. You're violating my airspace. If I could have said that in my freshman dorm, I mean, Allison, I, I love Al Pal, but <laughs> we had a three person dorm in a two person dorm and it was a lot of, uh, and we were all very close. Thank God. But listen, I'm going to go out there today and say, the exact same. I'm going <laughs> to say to her live face. With her. Yeah. yeah we, <laughs> like she hasn't changed since college. I feel the same way you did. I'm like, get out of my airspace. No, I, I say that, but I'm like, no, she was definitely the one who felt that way about me. Who am I kidding? Like, I was the needy one. Like, what's going on? I I can't imagine having to live in a, like, a 500 square foot room with you. Like, a 400 square oh foot room Oh my god. And for the first time ever, like, leaving the house and that, like, what you're talking about, like, is this normal? Like, I was just eating pickled herrings and people were like, this freaky girl covered in hair. Or what did I say earlier? <laughs> freaky German girl. Something about being covered in hair. I also remember her, like, finding you in the bathroom, on the floors, and stuff yeah like, oh that's right that was when i accidentally overdosed uh that was bad but oh i joke God. about it allison won't let me talk about it she gets really upset um <laughs> that was an accident it really was i had i had lost like 30 pounds on because of crohn's disease and uh well, you hadn't put, you didn't know you had crohn's yet right uh i had just been diagnosed and they gave mm. and i was like in so much pain that they gave me percocet which uh, at this point my mom didn't allow me to have tylenol when i was little like even after wisdom teeth everything she would flush all the painkillers down the toilet and so i was like oh okay this is just for pain and so they were like take two to three pills every four hours and i was like well i'm in a lot of pain so i took three but they didn't really account for that a i'd never taken any painkillers and b i had lost like 35 or 40 pounds and was like decrepit and so i took like three percocets and i woke up at four in the morning and i couldn't see it was actually what it was probably i thought i was dying i was probably dying um and i crawled to the bathroom but all i could think of was like oh my god i don't want to wake allison she has her lab tomorrow morning like i don't want to bother her and i mean it's like the ultimate bullshit move of like boundary like i was just like i don't want to bother anybody and so she found me on the floor ultimate people pleasing yeah i was i was i tried to take my temperature but then i was like i can't see like i had fully lost my vision i thought i was gonna go blind um and i just laid on the bathroom floor because the tile was cold on my face and i just sweated out all night and uh I really thought I was going to die. There was just, I couldn't hear either. There was just like this high pitch ringing in my ears. And so I couldn't see my phone. So I couldn't like call an ambulance. You know um, what? Hmm. Homie, that sounds like Florida. Em, I literally tell you this every time you tell me this story. I know, but I think I'm finally hearing, while thinking of my experience, hearing your side effects. Yeah, I would yeah. always say like, hey, Em, that happened to me. And you were like, Florida. I don't know. <laughs> Huh. I tried to tell you it was the same thing, or it, it sounded like the same thing. It, That's why I've told the, you the story so many times. The first half of it feels like it. The second half of it really was like a really fucking gnarly cold, like a really terrible, terrible flu. Yeah, well, you were sick, though, too. Like, I just had, I mean, I was sick in a different way, but I didn't Still, have the flu. Ugh, anyway. Wow. Yeah, because I also lost my vision <clears throat> and all that. Ugh. Yeah, it's really scary. Yeah, so I uh anyway allison was so angry at me. <laughs> so fucking because then she ended up having to skip class and drive me to the hospital anyway and they were like wow you really fucking overdosed and i was like i didn't know i followed the instructions on the thing and so now i'm still really scared of painkillers which is probably good but like woof. sure okay sorry that was like way off off topic but um anyway, anyway so you were you were violating airspace and, everyone uh, was violating air i didn't want to violate her airspace is my point okay <laughs> i was like i'm gonna violate my own airspace in this bathroom until she finds me on the floor and she was like she, she, she was like she was like you're violating my airspace now <laughs> she was like what did you think i wanted to wake up to a dead body would that have been better than you waking me up in the middle of the night to take I- i've never actually seen allison like really angry at me until this day and since then i'm, I'm scared it's, of her uh, she, look i've seen her mad she is a scary person to get mad yeah she she knows when she's mad and it's usually for a good reason and uh you, you, sorry Elle. i love you okay thank you for <laughs> taking me to the hospital sorry okay so sorry this is so off topic uh so anyway cena do started to feel uh trang was starting to feel like cena do was being needy and it was becoming off-putting and she was like, okay, like you're violating my airspace. And during this time, Sina was also having a tough time with her academics. Um, she 
got an A uh, in biology uh, b- where she worked with prominent researchers at Beth Israel Hospital um, investigating the human immunodeficiency virus in monkeys. You know, how we all did uh, in college. Yeah, yep. um, I remember that class. Mm-hmm. Uh, and her professors explained that although Sina Du, like Trang and many other students, uh, discovered she wasn't an academic star anymore, she was maintaining a B average with no difficulties. However, a B average was going to keep her out of like top medical schools. It was just wasn't at the level where you would get into, I don't know, like a top, top, top rated medical school coming from Harvard. At least that's what they believed. So uh, another senior who lived next door to Trang and Senior Do at this time said they both complained when the dorm was noisy. They spent most of their time like by themselves studying. Uh, They would call up or bang on the door if we were talking. They were polite, but they were just really quiet. So, you know, they weren't like partiers, weren't really um, social with people on their floor. And in a New York Times article, it said, when Miss Ho and Miss Tedes started rooming together, they certainly seemed well matched, which this is also a little bit problematic in my mind, but I'll read it anyway. Both had risen from humble circumstances, Miss Tedes mm-hmm. in Ethiopia and Miss Ho in Vietnam, which is like just because two people are from a different country yeah. and grew up like with with uh, in poverty or not even in poverty because uh, she was the really well family off. was well off. Yeah. And uh, the Ho family wasn't. But so even more of a reason, like, why are you just lumping them together? Because yeah. they grew up in war torn countries like, OK, but that doesn't mean that they're well, going to be yeah. friends. Yeah, mm. so uh, th- a lot of this story also reflects that, which I, I don't want to say it's the 90s, but, like, growing up in the 90s, even my mom, who's, like, a white lady, got so much flack and was always called the nanny, and it was, like, because right. she had a German accent, and it was, like, and she was white, so it was so much less bad than a lot of people have it. Right. But even just everybody asking me if she was my nanny all the time Ugh. because she had an accent, like, I just, I know how people <laughs> were in the 90s and still are, but... This just doesn't surprise me, I guess I should say. Right, 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 right. Um, so even though Sinadu was like, thought the world of Trang, Trang did not really feel the same way, um, but she kept it to herself. She was a nice girl. She wasn't like mean to her or anything, um, but tried to keep her distance. So by the point where they needed to decide whether they were rooming together or not, Trang told Sinadu she had decided to room with another group of girls the following year. So... Trang had to tell Sinadu, I don't want to live with you next year. Yikes. Week. It's always awkward. Been there. Yes. Yes. It's always awkward, but it's way more awkward in this scenario because, well, well we know how it ends. Yep. So she told Sinadu uh, she wasn't going to live with her. She was going to live with a different group of girls, and Sinadu did not react well to this. So a week before the murder, an anonymous note was sent to the Harvard Crimson newspaper along with a picture of Sinadu, and the note read, Keep this picture. There will soon be a very juicy story involving this woman. Ugh. Later, through DNA tracing, it was discovered that Sinadu had sent this picture and note herself. <gasps> well, yeah. okay. <sighs> so a fellow student in her physics course had seen her in the library um, the Tuesday before their physics exam, and he said, you could see she was stressed out. She couldn't seem to study, and her face was very worried. But at the same time, it's like, it's Harvard finals week. I'm sure everybody looks right. stressed out and like. St- if anything, you would like, you would notice the person who didn't look who like. wasn't. You, you at me on Harvard's campus. I'd yeah, be like, M, Like, who wants to get burritos? It's like, <laughs> M, it's finals week. Yeah, you and I would have been the ones who were like, God, these two are fucking clowns over here. Do you want to uh, get burritos is probably the most spoken phrase I said in college on a yeah, daily basis. Which is why I'm always amazed <laughs> that we weren't friends in grad school. I'm like, the world really tried to keep us apart because. I really don't know how on earth that didn't I happen. I, because also I like in co- in grad school I made a point to like try to approach people and like ask them to like go out and get some. That's how I became friends with Christine Maiden. Yeah, because I literally was like, I don't know you, but do you want to go get lunch with me? Had- well, you know me. I'm always fucking like anxious and depressed, so I try to avoid people as often as possible. So I'm sure I saw you being friendly and went like red alert i'm gonna hide (laughs) so that's probably precisely what happened probably um i probably knew you were very friendly and went "Uh uh-oh i'm scared and hit it's Um, commitment it was it would have been i would have been asking you to commit to a friendship i don't like that or commit to even going to get burritos which it's a lot to ask of me to leave the house i know it i know it (laughs) to put on pants to leave the house okay um anyway so uh she uh ended up taking one of her finals but then she got medical exemptions for the other two 
And during one of the exams she was supposed to take, she actually went on a brunch date with a fellow Ethiopian student. And later on, he realized that she had this brunch with him to say goodbye before she would take <gasps> her own life. Oh, shit. So she it was just that kind of behavior where you don't realize until, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty of like, oh, dear, I now see what she why she was acting strange and all that. Um, on the Saturday when she was supposed to be taking her physics exam, she was sitting in her room crying the whole time, according to Tao, who was the visiting friend who was there to help Trang move out. Um, and Sinadu's younger brother, who was actually at Dartmouth, uh, still in hindsight had trouble admitting that she had anything going on. Um, apparently she had called him at midnight a few hours before the murder or before the murder and apparently he was probably the last person she spoke to and mm. he still later said like oh no she seemed fine which is like well okay i guess but mm. i don't know we'll we'll get to that yeah but so like i said Tedes had purchased the hunting knife in advance and that sunday morning she at 8 a.m she murdered her roommate trang Wow. Uh, and then took her own life. Um, in the days after the murder, it was generally speculated uh, that Tedes had resorted to violence because um, Ho had asked not to room with her again in the fall. However, like, Sinadu's family said, no, she's the one who didn't want to room with Trang. Hmm. I don't know. It's kind of hearsay, I guess, or she said, she said. Okay. Um, but basically the, the general implication was, oh, uh, Trang said, I don't want to room with you. And Sinadu flipped out and killed her. In yeah. Okay. Vengeance. That checks out. That, yeah. Yeah. So this became obviously like a huge scandal in Boston media. Um, in an article in the New York times, uh, it was reported one student who asked not to be identified said she knew Miss Ho had been trying to find a different roommate next year because Miss Tedes would play music too loud and was inconsiderate of her privacy. Oh. But again, you never know with these things of like whether people are just like interviewed and they're like, oh yeah, I heard this or I knew her because they had like a lab with her or something. You know what I mean? Like, right. I hesitate to trust everything that people report in the newspapers, especially because later a lot of people say they were Sinadu's friend and like, it's kind of like she was very clear she didn't have any friends. Yeah, it, it, if anything is understood about this yes. story, it's that she didn't have a friend. So Right. So I find it sometimes hard to believe, of like, how much is this being spun? How much are people just kind of, like, wanting to be involved with the story? Um, so it's hard, it's hard to know. But <clears throat> um, another report said... Uh, in the New York Daily News said the Boston Globe reported that Tedes had sent a letter to Ho last month that indicated she felt abandoned, which I do believe that because she was known for sending letters to people as to express yeah. her loneliness. Um, and apparently the note said, I thought we were going to do stuff together. You'll always have a family to go to and I'm going to have no one. So she really felt abandoned by Trang because she was like, I finally have a roommate, a friend. And then Trang was like, nope, I'm going to my other group of friends. And she felt like... I mean, it's it's not hard to put two and two together of like, mm -hmm. I mean, she was so desperate for friends. She was writing to strangers and then she finally found someone she thought she had like enough similar interests with that yeah. like something could happen yeah. and then all of a sudden this person's like i have other people i'd rather live with i mean yeah. talk about snapping you yeah know? yeah i mean it's that it's that classic like feeling rejected, rejected. yeah leading mm -hmm. to you know with everything else obviously building up obviously it had train train was not at fault by any means but it's no sort it of was like, like a it was like a long time coming and she just happened to be the the catalyst or like totally the one, the one to really make uh, uh an er erratic behavior present itself yes exactly it was sort of like a long fuse and then finally it, it went off and she didn't know obviously that this would happen right um because who would so she just felt completely abandoned um and uh according to Sinadu's father he was a retired high school principal back in Ethiopia, and he said his daughter never indicated that she was unhappy at Harvard or with her roommate. He said there is no friction or divorce in our family, which is an odd... I mean, I don't know. I'm like, there is in mine, but okay. Um, <laughs> congrats, like, I guess. Uh, I'm guilty of that. Uh, yeah, what is that? <laughs> nice humble brag, I guess. Yeah, like, congratulations. Um <laughs> <laughs> but uh, ultimately, Trang's family understandably thought Harvard could have done more to prevent their beloved daughter's death. And in 98, they filed a lawsuit against the school alleging wrongful death, conscious pain and suffering, and emotional distress. They charged the university as well as the people in charge at Dunster House Dormitory with negligence. And they felt that they had plenty of evidence that Sinadu was having a breakdown and could have prevented the deaths. 
Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, which I didn't realize, this apparently was not the first sign of extreme mental health issues among students affiliated, not with Harvard necessarily, but with this dormitory. <gasps> so it's Ooh. like seemingly cursed. I mean, apparently in the prior, the year prior to Cena Do's suicide, three other Harvard students had taken their lives, two of whom lived in this dorm. So Whoa. literally the year before she took her own life, two other people had died by suicide in that same dorm. Yeah. And I, I do wonder, like, I don't know if this is a specific, like, honors dorm. Maybe there's more pressure. I, I don't know anything about, like, what the specific dorm is. But um, this dorm seems to have some sort of uh, yeah, bad it's history. Like, it's like you almost, like, if if this wasn't so fresh and, like, um, it, we you know, we weren't talking about it for so long and... It, one could say if this happened years and years and years and years and years ago, it's like the recipe for like, you know, spooky stories coming out of it. Yeah, or yeah. It's like you hear of somebody who died in a dorm and that's why it's haunted. And now it's like, well, it keeps happening over and over again. Yeah, yeah it, it makes it, you it wonder. Does. Yeah. So um, let's see. So two people, three people had died by suicide the year before at Harvard. Two of them lived in this dorm room. Or I'm sorry, this dormitory. Um, A few months before the murder-suicide, a 1994 graduate of Harvard who had also lived at Dunster House died by suicide, and a week after that, a student who lived off campus but was affiliated with Dunster House Dormitory also died by suicide. Hmm. So this place just has a connection to a lot of dark, dark events. Um, And in response to suicide suicides before seen to do so the all the ones that occurred beforehand the crimson staff called for change in harvard's mental health offerings through an editorial piece in the newspaper and um in 1994 according to this plea making an appointment to see a mental health professional took 10 to 15 days on average and students who were in need of long-term therapy were often referred to outside hospitals because they didn't feel that this was part of the university health plan. So it was sort of like you didn't have many options. Whoa. And if you did find, uh, you did access it, it took over two weeks sometimes to even find someone to help you, which obviously with mental health concerns, we know sometimes you need much more urgent yeah. assistance. Two weeks two weeks is a, a lot of time Long to time. wait to get Completely. help. Yeah. And at that point, like clearly you're jumping through hoops. So who knows if you're in a position to even have the stamina to deal with that sure. and the health yeah. limitations. Um, so this is just really, uh, kind of showing the underbelly, I guess, of the, the lacking services here. uh, Shining a light. Shining a light on it. Yes. Yes. Um, it's almost like the issues manifesting in a really horrible, horrible way. Um, so for starters, when Sinadu initially arrived at Harvard as a freshman, um, Harvard apparently offered nothing except for a two hour orientation for foreign students. So they just put him in a room, gave him a two hour orientation and said, good luck. And Good like fucking luck. And like set them on their own. There wasn't a support group. There wasn't like a, you know, special advisor or anything for people moving from outside the country. It, it just kind of like, this is, I mean, the, the fucking orientation we got in LA was probably more like, here's what winter is, you know? We literally LA. had a, we literally had a class called like life in LA or yes, something. Yes, we did. You're right. Where like the whole semester, like it was like for attendance. If you, if you went all the time, like your attendance was basically the only thing you were getting graded on. It was just to make sure everyone was like, it was a way for them to like weekly rally us together and make sure we were all like, okay. Like hadn't like driven off the I-5 by accident. Yeah. And like yeah. knew we had to drive a car in Los Angeles. Yeah. yeah. So they didn't even have anything besides like one orientation and then they were kind of set off their own. That's just a good example. Um, and then when Cena Dude did try to flag her mental illnesses, which she did, uh, she was offered therapy sessions with a doctor of education. So like a PhD rather than a therapist one day a month. However, mm. this is pretty disturbing. Uh, shortly before the murder suicide, the doctor uh, or the, you know, professor, whoever was seeing her, uh, tried to reach her, but not because he sensed anything was off, but because he wanted to cancel their next appointment, which, Oof. again, was only once a month. So you can just Yikes. see that this is not going to be helpful. Yeah. Um, can you imagine canceling that appointment and then a few days later finding out? Not that obviously this person I know, is to I know. blame, but like. No, it, but to be like. A human to human, it's very, it's interesting to be like, oh, wow, like that person really needed that help. That must and have I, been like, I, a, yeah. The guilt alone of like, oh, wow, I I could have helped. Did I just yeah. rip my own headphones just out? Happened. Yes. I just ripped my own headphones oh, out. Oh, no. <laughs> Hang on. Um, but no, I the guilt alone, 
whether or not I mean it wasn't their fault but the guilt of being like wow they needed help and I just canceled yeah and you and know? you know like I can't I imagine helped. being that person who is responsible for giving these therapy sessions they're probably overloaded with tasks because there is no real therapy offered so it's like now right. they're responsible for all these students it's not their job so like I can understand how it's just a bad system for everybody involved yeah um so yeah anyway as we can probably expect Harvard did not like these accusations that they were not uh doing enough for mental health um an esteemed former dean of the college named John Fox was among those who quote didn't appreciate the jabs at the university mm. um and he's been quoted in response to another student who pleaded with him about receiving counseling and medication saying I have received my medical care from the university for over 40 years and I'm entirely satisfied. And your attacks on all things Harvard are tiresome. If you don't like it here, go away. Whoa. Okay. Cool. Cool. Got cool, it. cool. 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 John. It. Cool, John. Johnny boy. And <laughs> this apparently was not an unusual response. Um, in re- in response to Sina Du Tedes' situation. <laughs> It's a lot of S's. Uh, one would think that this kind of a tragedy after so many other suicides, you'd think, well, maybe they took this time to kind of reflect and say, like, okay, there's a pattern, there's a problem. But no, their response was short and accusatory. The dean of the college was quoted as saying, in a case of this complexity, we prefer to centralize information. Everyone is looking for a villain, and we don't want to be it. Mm. So they were basically on the defense from the get-go. Um, But there is a woman named Melanie Thornstrom who had graduated from Harvard in 87, and she was actually a professor in creative writing who ended up publishing an analysis of the murder, uh, and it was called Halfway Heaven, Diary of a Harvard Murder. So she basically wrote a book about this murder as a Harvard grad herself and as a professor of creative writing at Harvard. Now, there, it, this is also problematic in its own way, um, because I, this is not me saying this. I have not read this book, but people have said that, although it does give an insight into Tedes, uh, quote, Thernstrom never lets you forget that she is a Harvard insider, and she cannot resist bringing her own experience onto the scene. So that's kind of the review this book has gotten, which got it, got we've it, got gotten it. way shittier reviews on iTunes <laughs> that I don't like to abide by. So I'm not saying that's the truth, but that's just the reception it got. Got it. Um, so let's see, Thernstrom, uh, Melanie Thernstrom was initially drawn to the case because she sympathized toward Tedessa's kind of outcast status, and it was clear she'd been suffering mentally. However, ironically enough, Sinadu had actually applied to be in Melanie Thernstrom's creative writing class, but <laughs> Thernstrom called, said she didn't accept her into her course because her writing was boring, which is like, ouch. We okay. That's yeah. harsh, but Okay. Not nice. Um, no, not really. Uh, so it, it's also weirdly contrasted because in the book, Thernstrom uses all of uh, Sinadu's old journals as like her writing to reference it and say like, look at her troubled soul. And it's like, okay, but she wasn't good enough for your class until she yeah. died and now it's relevant. It's a little I bit. I feel like you, you've put yourself in a situation where like you don't get to use that book as part yeah. of your curriculum. You it's know? almost real. And it gets worse. Like it gets way more um, just problematic. So uh anyway so she read the journals as part of her research into the book and this is pretty fucked up the new yorker actually sent melanie thernstrom to ethiopia unannounced (gasps) yeah and she fucking showed up on the family's doorstep oh my god what and they obviously were like utterly shocked that this like white lady just showed up and said i'm writing a book about your daughter can i have her journals like that was what happened absolutely fucking literally not that's just like the fu- like the fucking oh gall, God. the fucking unearned yeah. confidence to like just show up without warning to get a better story it's so fucked up um because they they could have warned the family and said do you mind if we come and visit after right. your daughter was just savagely you right. know thrown into this horrible Ugh. media frenzy and died by suicide and it's just awful so uh, she spent her time in Ethiopia trying to get to know Sinadu more. She dove into Sinadu's personal diaries, which she got her hands on. And um, she, uh, in comparison to what she had said about uh, the writings that Sinadu had submitted for her creative writing class, she said that her journals displayed uncanny capacities for self-expression and self-analysis. She left behind an extraordinary record, that of an intelligent, insightful, strong-willed person using all those capacities to fight as hard as she could for mental health and losing. It just all seems a little bit, um, I don't even know the right word, uh, showy, like using it for 
your own benefit. I don't know. It just feels icky to me. I don't know what the right word is either. But it, you're right. It's I mean, it, it feels, yeah, it's like not your fucking place, first no, of all. No, And like to put the family in that position, yeah, it's just kind of gross. Um, which I'm also blaming the New Yorker who sent, sent her there. I'm not saying like, oh, this is all her fault. There are a lot of people involved in this, but... Um, it just seems like there's a, a general lack of awareness yes. for, like, respect. Yes, yes, yes. On so many different levels. Like, mental health. Like, um, even just... Grief. Like, grief. your family. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, I, uh, yeah. International custom and saying, like, oh, they're the same person because <laughs> they come from two different countries. Oh, oh yeah. That's on too. that level. Like, xenophobia. Yep. Yeah. So, um, anyway, the her writings, she had a lot of these spiral-bound journals, um they kind of revealed a lot of her deteriorating sanity. She fantasized about an ideal friend. She talked about her inability to obtain psychiatric care. Um, Apparently, so this is also, this is also very kind of gross is this is what Melanie Thurnstrom wrote in her book after she read, after she showed up at this family's door and took all their journals, uh, their daughter's journals. She said, we see that scene to burned in a private hell of loneliness, more profound than most of us can imagine. She never felt loved. And it seems like that she was in fact not loved. And so did not have an ability to feel love or to relate to others. in even the most fundamental way she could not feel her heart. And she knew it as she put it in her hopeless public letter. I am like a person who can't swim choking for life in a river oh my god like you just said her family didn't love her after you showed up on their doorstep and demanded her private journals but what a fucking insult yeah like it's hey your your kid's dead also let me take some of the most personal items from your home that belong to her and also you didn't love her and i'm gonna let everybody know that you're fucking garbage and you're the reason she's incapable of love and murdered someone yeah but look it's, at how great i am but look at this article that's being written like i mean it's it's everything that's why i want. kept in that review not because i was like oh yeah i agree because i don't know i've never read it but because i was like that's an interesting angle to the yeah. rest of the story like that people are like she talks about going to harvard all the time like i don't know i thought it was an interesting angle on this um so in another entry, Sinadu had tried to teach herself ways to make people like you. Uh, she wrote to herself in the third person with instructions like, do not show what you really think, put on a mask, or listen to inspirational tapes. And when the tips didn't work out, she anguished about what she called her heart failure thing. And she felt, quote, dead, and it is hard to warm myself up. So mm. when she fa- f- met Trang in the journals, you can see that she believed she'd finally found a friend, someone she could have a genuine relationship with. So when she was rejected, that was too much for her to bear. And she, quote unquote, snapped, for lack of a better term. Sure. Um, so at one point, Thurston says she empathized with Sina Du, saying that while at Harvard, she also kept diaries and said, in college, I was so fearful my roommates would read my diaries. I wrote certain passages in ecclesiastical Latin. <laughs> Okay, that's the most Harvard thing I've ever fucking heard. Though. I know. I was like, really? I would literally, if I had Cornelia, to like, write something. Cornelia Puella-esque Agricola. Agricola. <laughs> that if would I... be my fucking journal entry over and over again. Mine would literally just be like normal English except A is B and B is C and <laughs> yeah. C is D. I'd write and... in pig Latin and be like, no one will ever understand. <laughs> I would just like, every letter would be a different emoji or something. Like it would be so <laughs> easy to crack a Sometimes code that I Sometimes I would literally write like, so I found a journal entry recently that said, die tragedy. And it was a, it was a lyric of Billy Talent. And I thought I was just really deep. And it was like, run me over with your truck or I don't know, something like <laughs> really emo. And then the page before I wrote, Mom, if you are reading this, you should not be reading this. I will know. I will know if you read this. And like, my mom didn't read my journals because she really, quite frankly, wasn't that interested for obvious reasons. But like, that was my attempt at keeping them away. I was like, do not read it or I will know that you read my deep, dark secrets. What a threat of like, you better <laughs> thank your lucky fucking stars I chose to let you live. And then I would, I know, like, uh, you better watch out. I have control here. And then I would leave it on the living room table next to my like empty taco plate and be like, but you would you do go. that. On, but the Gemini and you did that on purpose, hoping to lure Probably. someone in so you could yell at them. So she could be like, why are you writing run me over with your truck? And I'd be like, it's my favorite song. I wish I'd you like, knew that it's about not a, me. It's not a phase, mom. It's this is who phase. I am. This is who and I also, am. If you knew me at all, you'd know that Billy Talent is my favorite band. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway. So, here we go. 
Yikes. Okay. Uh, anyway, so the most shocking extreme thing of all is one of the final statements in these journals that Melanie Thernstrom discovered, which read, the bad way out is suicide. The good way is killing, savoring <sighs> their fear than suicide. So you can just see that she had like devolved into just like, this is the only option left for me. Yeah. Um, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, there were several people who had a duty as a student of Harvard that they had a duty to knowing that she was struggling, having like evidence of these letters she was writing to strangers saying she was desperate and lonely. Like they, I think they had a duty to, to help her. See something, say something. Yeah. And, and they're responsible for her. She's in their care. Yeah. Um, so obviously she needed help. Um, and a lot of this, I, I want to be clear as well. This is why it's problematic is because I am not at all saying this is excusable that Trang it wasn't Sinidu's fault that she killed. I mean, I'm not saying that at all. Um, obviously, this was not the way to go. And um, I just think that there were a lot of things that could have been done to hopefully prevent both of these deaths. And yeah, there's no excuse for murdering anyone, your roommate or anyone. There's no excuse. Right. So I'm not saying like, well, we can excuse it or explain it. Um, there's just... Uh, there's just a really sad story leading up to it that kind of sheds light on to why this happened. Right. Um, and that clearly something needs to change or needed to change. Um, so there's, there's a lot of argument online about this as far as like, well, she was mentally ill, but that doesn't excuse murder, but someone should have helped her, but also that doesn't give her the right. So there's a lot of back and forth. Sure. Um, and so part of the problem in my mind is that the two girls became kind of one, like they became kind of linked in this story as like equal victims, which mm. I do believe they're victims in different ways, but Trang was just like stabbed to death by her roommate. Like she's, right. I just don't think her family thought it was fair to say, oh, they were both equally victimized right. do you know what i'm saying like no i totally get and also yeah. i mean i i mean i don't it, it's, it's so a, hard it's to, a, to talk about this it's like it's a tough spot because you want to you want to uh, respect the 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 person who died and yes it, it did did not deserve that at all but i also think there is um space to talk about mental illness and yes yes i i know that if you know, fingers crossed this isn't how I go, but if someone who was mentally unstable is the cause of my death one day, I would want people to be able to, like, you know, separate the situations and yes, honor the yes, fact yes. that that I left, but also, like, that doesn't mean that someone didn't need help or two really terrible things wouldn't have happened, you know? Yes, yes, completely. Like, they're not... um they're not uh oh god now i'm forgetting the english word you know me and my english but uh they're not I'd help, but exclusive I, I i'd help but i also don't speak english very well, so <laughs> that's but true. No, like but like yeah i i mean it would because like if something happened to you i wouldn't want to you know feel like i wasn't uh taking the time to to focus on what had happened to you but i would also be aware that like had there been a system in place or a better a better way of going about things where yes. we paid attention to the person who needed help then yes. two people wouldn't be in a really right. dark and, space and, right now or right exactly and they're not mutually exclusive in the way that there are two tragedies here or maybe even more that intertwined but aren't necessarily like hand in hand the same right. thing and aren't necessarily completely separate it's like there's just a lot of tragedy woven into this on different levels but trang herself is a murder victim here and like that yes. you know has to be recognized as well as far as i'm concerned so yeah exactly and it, so i'm just going to read this quote because i think it is a good way of explaining it so in Thernstrom's book, she says, a peculiar discourse de developed on campus in which rather than being viewed distinctly as murderer and victim, the girls were recalled in one breath as if their deaths were the result of some unfathomable blood rite, like a suicide mm. pact about which no one could say who was to blame or where the evil lay. So it's almost like they blurred as far as like the, yeah. the perpetrator and the victim because there is the perpetrator was also a victim in a way, right. but on different right. levels. Um, so to a certain extent, I believe Harvard was to blame for what happened to Sinidu's devolving mental health, or at least not helping and not stepping in when they had a, a duty, right. in my opinion, to help. Um, so in 1999, the London Re Review of Books reviewed 
Melanie's book and said uh, the Harvard administration were just protecting their own interests, basically, and that it seemed like no one took interest in Sinadu because they couldn't distinguish between psychotic behavior and Ethiopian behavior. <gasps> so they basically were saying like, well, they were foreigners and people just didn't know if they were foreign or if they were psychotic. It's like that is so xenophobically horrendous. Like, I don't even know where to begin with assessing oh that. God. It's like, oh, well, we didn't know if we should, like, tend to murderous activity because that might just be how they was shake hands normal? in another culture. Yeah, yeah what the exactly. Fuck? Like, was that the normal? You guys if, that's what you, if that's what you genuinely think about Ethiopians, then why on, sorry, like, why on earth did you have Ethiopians on your campus if you thought that they're just, you know, casually killing Probably people? Probably because it looked good for numbers and diversity, you know? It's like, so you want all these people to join your school and then you're like, anyway, good luck out there. Here, here's another Vietnamese also, if, student. Now you if guys you, can get along. It's like, oh, yikes. If you really think people that you're inviting for the sake of diversity and numbers, if you really think they're more inclined to kill people, and then you're still only giving them no therapy. Or be psychotic, two, right? And a two-hour orientation and saying, right. good fucking luck. First of all, you don't get to be shocked that something like this happened. And you don't get yeah. to feel sorry about it. But also, that's literally not how it works. That's like not even it's just an it's just a ridiculously pathetic excuse. And it's so fucking racist that sh- horribly racist a pathetic defense that doesn't stand doesn't hold water at all. Um, and so it's just pretty troubling. And the same review also talks about the racism in Trang's case, saying that university records show that Trang, in a mild mannered way, seems to have sought help repeatedly to escape Sinadu's attentions. Here we go with the victim blaming. Ready? This part really upset me. Had she been less sympathetic toward her increasingly disturbed roommate, she would have insisted on a change of rooms long before she finally did. So she, I'm sorry. So she didn't fight hard enough. No, no, she didn't. Yeah. She was too mild mannered of a lady to, of a girl to. um, So So you teach people to like, to, you teach women to be sweet and kind and not people please. And then also, oh, well, they people please too much. And they didn't, they didn't really. They should have stood up for themselves. Get, you're not going to like this line. Trang, too, was doomed by her foreignness. She didn't express herself in ways who that... Who wrote this? My it's, great-grandpa? Right? Like, like who it's the really fuck? gross. She didn't express herself in ways that Harvard administrators understood. She was conciliatory and agreeable, and nobody bothered to understand her situation. It's like, okay. They what? couldn't understand that... She, I mean, it's... It's it's so trouble. It's so bad. It's like I don't even know how to begin. I mean, oh my god, that's. I like okay. to think everyone gasped I, with us when we. I read like that. to think there's a bunch of people screaming in their cars in their right cars, now, yeah. or like <laughs> silently shaking in their office. Like, their cat just ran away. Like what yeah. the fuck, mom? <laughs> Wow, um, <laughs> that is so fucking angering. And it's like so infuriating because again, it's just like lumping them together, not just because they're both victims, but because they're both foreign. And it's like that on so many levels, this is just egregiously disrespectful. And so anyway, this is the end. I know this has gone really long, but to sort of conclude, um, apparently there was discussion on campus about having a joint scholarship, which they called which one uh, review called a macabre kind of political correctness because they were like, let's just name the uh, scholarship after both of them, which is like, can you imagine her parents oh like God. learning that she and her murderer, her daughter and her murderer were linked in like the same scholarship. But there was a lot of debate over this. And um, apparently eventually they, uh, they only picked or only created a scholarship in Trang's, Trang Ho's name. And it's now called the Trang Ho Public Service Fellowship. And then in 2000, a Crimson article noted the five-year anniversary of their deaths alongside discussion of additions to Harvard's offerings after the tragedy. So uh, UHS mandated mandated that first-time appointments be scheduled within seven days, increased emergency hours and staffing, and changed its hours to better fit student schedules. In addition, mental health liaison tutors were installed in each house, and empty suites were set aside as safe places, which I also think is a really, really great... um, addition to mental health offerings Mm -hmm. uh so that is the story it's like i said really it's hard to say a a um a trigger warning because it's 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 the normal content but it's just like really the trigger warning there was like fucking ignorance and racism yes yes, that too i didn't even think to add that yeah 
Um, and I just want to add, I don't, I didn't even write this in my notes, which now I'm embarrassed about, but um, I do want to list the number for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-8255. Um, and you can talk to somebody uh, anytime, 24 seven. Um, you can also Google, Google a number or a website if you don't, if you have phone anxiety like me and chat online. Um, so yeah, that's the story. It's really dark. It's really upsetting. And it's not even that long ago, you know, 95, like, and not like that I long kn- ago. I know you said this already, but like, quote, people were different in the 90s. But it's like, first of all, I have a lot of thoughts about that. But if people were that different, and we have changed that much in this amount of time, then it's embarrassing that like, we could have done that so yeah well but you know i was thinking about this yesterday because i was like wow like because if you think like oh the 90s it doesn't seem that long ago but if you think about it it was like 30 years ago and so now you think like think about the 40s versus the 70s like the amount of like social change that happened in that time period or the 70s to the 2000s like if you think about it in that i think to us it doesn't seem long ago because we were alive but if you think about it in like historical context it's like of course things were different generations were growing up like it it's really no i totally i totally get it but yeah it's because we were alive because in my mind like all the darkest things that happened were when i wasn't here yet and it's like (laughs) em arrived on a on a sunbeam of light and the world (laughs) changed and i saved boston no but like i (laughs) but no like it's hard to priest it's, it's very um it's really sobering to realize like oh no i was alive during i mean like it's so obvious like yeah i was alive when dark shit happened i mean hello millennial like every fucking year something terrible we literally lived through (laughs) 9-11 but like it's just it's it's so much easier to separate yourself from it when you can blame it on the fact that it was forever ago and you weren't generation you weren't you weren't you didn't have any part of it it. yeah yeah and now okay if you think about it like this the only reason that i've been kind of making this connection is that my sister's in high school now and she's only 14 years younger than me. And my, her high school experience compared to mine is so wildly different. She has friends who are trans. She has friends who are like, you know, all different backgrounds, uh, socioeconomic classes. And I'm just like, this was not how I grew up. This is not how my high school experience was. Granted, I went to a different high school, but it's just so cool to see like, oh, this is a completely different upbringing and like, you know, experience was, in school as a teenager. It, it may, it's, uh, I was just thinking about this too, because my, cousin was asking me about like you know being queer you know well well why didn't you come out when you were in high yeah. school and I was like you didn't fucking do that like there was no oh I'm just gonna go tell my I'm gonna go oh my God, no. down the fucking stairs and tell people like I'm gay or something like you don't no 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 like you waited until you graduated high school so if you got kicked out of your house you were already yeah. on your way somewhere else anyway and like you didn't know anybody else they were like well didn't you have like role models and I was like no, literally, you want to know the role model I had for uh, the gay community growing up was Rosie O'Donnell and the wife, the ex-wife of Ross on Friends. Those are the only two gay people I knew. <laughs> I remember when I was six, the 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 Ross's ex-wife on Friends was the gay conversation I had with my mom. Where and I was it like, was scandalous. I was like, what does gay mean? And I remember my mom giving a very short answer and like being like, Oh, sometimes it just wasn't relevant. <laughs> sometimes men love men, sometimes women love women. And then I and then I didn't hear about it again until I was in high school and thinking like, shit, I think I'm the ex-wife from Friends. Like, yeah, it's a com- <laughs> all I fucking had. Yeah, mom, like, remember that. <laughs> but it's it is wild when I think about it. And I mean, I don't want to say it like this, but when you're selfishly think putting yourself in the scenario, it it you know means more. And so I do think like, yeah, 30 years ago, like, do you know how much? better my fucking life would have been if I could have just come out and dated. I mean, like, there are reasons why I didn't even have a first kiss until I was like 19. And it was because I couldn't kiss anyone I wanted to kiss in high school. I mean, it's just wild that like, I'm so happy for the future generations in in the queer world. But also, I'm so fucking jealous. of you You have no idea how lucky you are. I just but I feel like it's Yeah, and I, again, I, mean, I want to be clear, too. I'm not saying, like, oh, well, it's so easy now to be, you know. No, I'm speaking specifically in my own world of, like, queer. I'm not even talking about, like, racism and all these, like, horrible things we've just covered. I just yeah. got into my own little tangent because I just had this conversation, like, 24 hours ago where I was like, wow, the world is so different. It's just so fascinating to see, like, my sister and be like, oh, she has such a broader view of the world and an understanding of of uh, social concepts because probably also increase in internet, increase in, like, 
connecting with people that you wouldn't normally see in your day-to-day life and it's really uh yeah it's sobering to be like in the 90s my mom was the nanny and it was mortifying to always have to explain that she was my mother and she was divorced so we weren't allowed to go to people's houses and I lived near the quote-unquote bad part of town so no one was allowed to come over and it's just like now I'm thinking like my sister's like, who gives a fuck? And I'm like, you're allowed to swear? Like, I wasn't even allowed to say hell. Well, also, I was going to say, like, like your sister's generation is so much smarter than we ever were, too. Like, I, and maybe it's just because, like you said, like, there's, like, internet access and things yeah. that we didn't have at that age. But, like, I feel like anytime I talk to someone that's your sister's age, they just have so much more important shit to talk about than I ever did when I was that age. And I guess yeah. it really is just, like, it's there's so much more access to just learning faster and like i feel like i'm a late bloomer in learning because same so many people younger than us are just learning at you know just it's just part of life now and i feel like i'm catch playing catch up all the time so yeah, it's, it's like part of their upbringing and we had to do it on our own almost um and that's obviously not like a blanket statement i know a lot of people are no we know, just relate not in that to each position. other that way but just looking at my sister it's just like such a different uh I don't know experience and I think it's great um I just I have a lot of faith in in I do too I know a lot of millennials have like a a little a bitterness towards Gen Z just because I think we're a little jealous I'm not gonna lie I think I'm jealous for all the right reasons though like I just wish I got to be a part of that generation like no and I think we all want to be yeah I think we all all want to be because looking at them I'm like damn we were I think we were the lot we were like on the edge of like socially (laughs) understanding but like I think our parents no offense but I think like we got held we either held ourselves back or got held back a little bit and I think now it's so much more open and acceptable and obviously like we were I think yeah again that's like uh, sorry not to interrupt you but like I'm so on top of it with you of uh, like I feel like we were raised by yeah boomers and like even if they thought that they were like the hippies that were gonna save everyone it's like okay but then you gave you raised us and like we didn't really have anyone to like uh to back us on all of our like our willingness for change and then gen z showed up and they're like no 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 everything you were thinking let's keep that going let's- yeah it's almost like they took all our like we're just sitting here going what's a mortgage and they're like <laughs> give me the tiktok i'm going to change the world and we're like okay <laughs> like we're stuck i feel like we're like in uh arrested development of like we're kind of like supposed to be grown-ups but we're like no no we want to help the teens like i feel like we're in a weird position um so anyway this is over three hours i'm sorry y'all uh and even and- me for editing but no, but it's it's a it's a we're trying to say we think Gen Z is going to save us. Thirty years ago is shockingly different than what today was, and I'm so glad. Fingers crossed that there are less issues than uh, less issues like that that are so blatantly horribly racist. I feel like well, as a, I don't as know a, because 2020 kind of proved the opposite. But yeah, well, as, and it, yeah, as, as that, a as a as a as a globe, hopefully we're all learning that like we should be fucking better than that at the very least. Yeah, I mean, at least there are some of us who recognize it, which isn't enough. But you know. the winning team, the winning team, as I like to call it. Yeah. Anyway, so, on that anyway, note. thank you guys for listening. Hopefully, uh, you've got some Gen Zs in your life who are helping you in your day-to-day just become better people so uh that's all that's all i've got that's just I've got too. sorry this episode is long racism fucking sucks uh sorry about racism also can my that dad be, can that be the title of this episode uh but yeah i don't know i i mean that was a really good story it was definitely a thinker and a t- uh conversation piece so for sure was, it's a toughie um so i hope i did it justice but no you did i think you did i think it was good to i mean it's like really awkward conversations but i think they're it's good right, to I have them those are the ones so. to have yeah well so good job good job christine thank you and good job to you on the creepy ufo story um if you guys want to find out more about us you can go to and that's where drink.com or follow us at atwwd podcast or the m schultz or x teen schiefer or ooh gross with three s's not w's and uh otherwise i think we're gonna see you uh soon for listener episode Maybe that already came out. Yes. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know no, anymore. It comes out in two days. Tomorrow. 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 Oh, okay. See you tomorrow for our listeners episode <laughs> if you want more of this content. Yikes. Yikes. And? That's. Why? We. Drink. <laughs> ah, the amount of times we say yikes. Yikes. <laughs>